Okay. Um, good evening. It's May 10th, 2023. This is a joint meeting of the Town Council, the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, and the Human Rights Commission. As such, it has been posted as a meeting by all three committees. The open meeting law has been extended. This allows us to continue to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of any of the bodies being physically in the meeting location, but providing the public with adequate alternative access. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, or as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 or on their live stream. I will first call the town council to order and then ask the co-chairs of CSSJC and HRC to call their meetings to order. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the May 10th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 634. Uh, when I call upon each counselor, please make sure that you can hear us and we can hear you and then mute yourself again. Um, Shalini Balmel. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke is absent because of another engagement she could not change. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane is absent this evening. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Not here at this time. Okay, we'll keep an eye out. Allegra or D. You want to go ahead? And um, CSSJC to order. It is 635 and I am calling the CSSJC to order. Do I have to read the same extensions part? No, okay. no. just make no, sure everybody I'll, can hear you. Just other. make sure everybody that is here individually can hear you and you can hear them. Okay, perfect. Um, Miss Pat? Here. Um, Philip? Here. And Deborah, here. Um, I believe D had a conf. Uh, D is in the audience as an attendee. Um, oh, uh, Alec Athena will bring her in. Okay. D, can you hear us? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, and I don't see Freke's name. Um, but we do have a quorum, um, and I also, I do see that Alicia has joined us, so. Right. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and um, Philip, uh, would you please go ahead and uh, call HRC to order? Yep, uh, it's 6.36, and I called the the Human Rights Commission to order, and I will see members uh ronnie i'm here awesome victor present tyler here juliana present and i believe that is it including myself which i can clearly hear and speak <laughs> Okay, I'm just I'm just scanning the whole screen to make sure that everybody has been called on. I do want to check to see that the town manager can hear us and we can hear him. Yes, present. Uh, Pamela Young. I'm present. And Earl Miller. Present. Okay, and Athena is also with us. All right. Um, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let me or your chair know, uh, or Athena. Uh, and we're gonna use the raised hand button since we're all in different locations. Um, and if we have technical difficulties that cause us to have to make a note in the meeting, we will do so at the time. Um, there are no changes to the agenda as it is posted. Um, I'm going to ask each of the um, 
committees, whether or not they have any announcements. I don't see any hands, but, um, and let me just say at the end of the joint meeting with the town council, CSSJC and HRC are planning to continue their meeting using the same link. Okay. Um, we're going to, um, let me just mention also that in preparation for this meeting, Michelle Miller and I representing the council met with the co-chairs of CSSJC. We met, so we met with Dee and Allegra and we met with um, Philip Avila on Monday night and came up with kind of a plan for how to proceed with this very important discussion. Um, we are going to move to general public comment um, and we ask, we aren't going to use a timer. I'm sorry, a panelist has her hand up. Allegra, yes. I just um, wanted to note that Freke has joined us. So I just wanted to make sure that we could hear him for CSSJC. Great, Freke. Hi. You... Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can, I'm walking home. Oh, wonderful, all right, thank you. Thanks for letting us join your walk. Um, okay, are there any other uh, comments at this point or other people you need to bring in? Okay, then uh, with that, I'm going to ask, we're going to ask that people, you know, try to keep their remarks to three minutes, if at all possible. And, uh, but we are going to go ahead and have public comment now. From the standpoint of the joint meeting of HRC, CSSJC, and the town council, this is the only public comment. The other committees, when they continue their meetings, may decide they're going to have additional public comment. So if you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. Um, so with the agreement of the um, other committees, we'll go on. Um, so let me preface this and ask the town clerk, the clerk to the town council to place on the screen the motion that brings us to this meeting tonight. So on November 14th, the town council requested that the town manager work with the DEI department and other staff for the following seven purposes. And we're gonna be discussing each of those tonight uh, with both presentations and then discussion from all three of the committees. Um, at the end of the motion, which all of this was followed, a draft report was provided to the town council to the CSSJC and the Human Rights Commission. And they, in return, have written their advice back to the town council and the town manager. And that brings us to tonight. But I wanna actually recall a bit of our timeline that actually creates this larger meeting. And you can take that down. Um, on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a 46 year old black man was murdered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That led to several, and I do mean several, actions taken by the town council, the town manager, and the hard work of many people who are assembled here tonight and join us in the audience. First of all, there was a passage of a resolution in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd. That was on June 1st, 2020. Then there was a resolution on December 7th, a resolution of affirming the town of Amherst commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents. But you know, resolutions don't do it. They don't do a thing. They're a nice statement, but what really is important is right after that was the creation of the Community Safety Working Group. That group conducted significant research and made recommendations to the town council in two reports issued in May and October of 2021, including 
in those recommendations was that we create a community safety and social justice committee, which has happened and they're here with us tonight. They also asked that we create a community responder department and we did. We approved the funding and the creation of the Crest Department. They also asked that we create a Department of Ec Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and we did. And we are joined tonight by the directors of each of those groups. In addition to that, the council, not exactly in the same line, but related, approved the creation of the African Heritage Reparations Assembly and the creation of a fund for reparations the report for which we will hear from soon in terms of the recommendations of how that money would be spent. Following an incident on July 5th of 2022, lengthy discussions took place with the town council and in many instances, members of the CSSJC and the public. And those conversations continued from August into November 14th. And at that time, the town council passed the motion that appeared on the screen. Our goal tonight is to hear the updates from the town manager and his staff regarding these seven items and the advice from the CSSJC and HRC. Both items are in your packet. Upon hearing the presentations, I've asked Councillor Michelle Miller as a result of our conversation on Monday night as chair of the African Heritage Reparations Committee to facilitate the conversation on each of those items. As we conclude that portion of the discussion, all members of each committee will be asked if they would like to make any final comments. And I will formally request that the town manager include updates on these seven items and any other relevant actions in his monthly town manager's report. With that, I would like to ask um, town manager, Paul Bachelman, Pamela Young, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Earl Miller, the head of CRESS to proceed with their presentation. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you to everyone who's here tonight. Um, I appreciate your time uh, and being with us and giving us the opportunity to update you on where we are on a number of issues. As you, um, you can go to the next slide. Lynn's already talked about this. Um, so as the council voted on November 14th, this is the, the, the bullet points from the motion that Lynn uh, had listed before. Uh, and our, this is our opportunity to report on where we are, the actions that we've taken, the progress we have made in, in, in addressing these issues. We'll go through them one by one during the course of this presentation. Um, each is at, they're at different stages of prog progress. Some we've made good progress on, some not so good. And we're just gonna be laying out everything where we are. And uh, this is a progress report in essence. So next slide, please. So working with the DEI director and other staff, we submitted a written report address addressing the council's motion on March 17th. So tonight, Pam Pamela Nolan Young, the town's director Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Earl Miller, the town's director of our CRESS or Community Responder Program uh, Department, will summarize the report. I hope this information will provide you and the broader community with an update on the work we are doing. We're very proud of the work and that has been done so far. You know, we, we don't often get the opportunity to step back and to recognize the hard work that is being done. So tonight, I want to thank Pamela and Earl publicly. First, for their decision to come to work for the town, and also for their dedication to the mission of their jobs, and for the highly professional skill, knowledge, and social intelligence that they bring to the work. We would not be where we are today where we, if, we were not with, if we did not have these two visionary leaders leading these two departments. So thank you, Pamela and Earl, and right up the offset. I think it's really important. We don't get to say that very often. Next slide. So in less than 10 months, the town has created and operationalized two new municipal departments. I can't tell you how unusual this is in the municipal world. That's the world I live in. It's just not done. Um, we recruited and convinced two great leaders, Pamela and Earl, that this was the opportunity to that was not to be missed. In turn, they recruited and hired a strong, diverse staff to support the two departments. 
some we knew, like Jennifer Moyston, who brings extraordinary skills and knowledge of the community, who is our assistant DEI director. And we hired others who were part of our community, but were not new to working for the town. So both today, today, both of our departments are working actively to meet their respective missions. There's obviously more work to be done, more goals to set, and more goals to meet. It is important to note in this work, there are no check boxes to check and say done. There's no mission accomplished. The work is ongoing, it, and it will be ongoing for a very long time. We all know that. That's why it has been so important for us to step back in times and look at what we have accomplished in a relatively short period of time, and to thank all of those who are devoting their time and effort to bettering our community. We are very fortunate to have them all. Next slide. Oh, no, no actually, go back one. Um, so I want to take a minute to talk about um, how we have approached these two departments. And as I mentioned, this is sort of a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we're working to build two departments for the long haul. That's why it's been important to establish these departments as true parts of our town governance structure and to establish a theory of and model of growth. As we, have, as we have formed these departments, we've learned a lot. We've learned from our experiences as we continue to engage with the community. We've created new partnerships and shaped existing partnerships. While we may have a vision laid out, that vision must be dynamic, not static. We must be willing to listen and to change in these new areas. We are in an ever evolving and changing landscape. One of the things I talk about with Earl, well, first I, I, I tell him that he should keep good notes because he's gonna be writing a book someday and go on some big fancy speaking tour because what he's doing and the Crest Department is doing is really remarkable and setting, a state, setting the standard for communities throughout the country. And as a side note, today uh, we had our first uh, master's thesis submitted that was done on the Crest program or, or part of the Crest program. And that just shows that this is groundbreaking work that graduate students are starting to look at and say, what can we learn from the, what they're developing? So the thing that we talk about is that we need to establish an effective level of service. We work it, we get good at it. We make sure that it can be maintained. And once we got that under our belts, we level up to the next level of service. Each level brings new challenges, complications, negotiations, and we continue to repeat that. We set expectations, we meet them, and then exceed them, and we are ready to move on. In short, we need to be building these departments so that they are sustainable financially and operationally so that they will be contributing to the town for years and decades to come. So now I'd like to hand it over to Pamela uh, to get into the specifics of the report, and then we'll go to Earl to conclude. All right, um, would you advance to the next slide? Uh, so um, again, good evening, and I am pleased to be able to give you the status report on behalf of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So next slide, please. So um, as has already been uh, mentioned before, this work really began with the Community Safety Working Group. And whenever Jennifer and I are talking about the office, she always insists that we begin uh, with acknowledging that the work was done by the Community Safety Working Group. And so I also want to acknowledge that a lot of the work that we're doing in our, in our office um, finds its root with the Community Safety Working Group. Next slide, please. So uh, as you know, our office has been in existence for just 10 months. Jen and I were sworn in on July 5th and we're looking forward to our one year anniversary. Next slide, please. Although you know, Jennifer, um, one of the things that we've done as we've introduced our office is to reintroduce people to the work that she's done in the community. So she's almost a lifelong resident of Amherst She's been a town employee for 10 years. In fact, her 10 year anniversary was on May 6. She is a community participation officer. So she, along with uh, Angela Mills and Brianna Sedrit, are responsible for outreach to the community in addition to her work with the DEI office. And as you know, she's the driving force be behind a lot of the DEI 
efforts that the town has engaged in. And she's soon to be president of the Amherst Survival Center. Next slide, please. So I am new to Amherst, but not new to Western Mass. I have over 20 years uh, experience in DEI. I'm certified as an NCBI and bystander trainer, and I'm a founding member of the Massachusetts Fair Housing uh, Center. So um, while Amherst is new to me as far as employment is concerned, I've been um, a resident of Western Mass off and on since 1988. So I'm, I'm pleased to be back in Western Mass and, and pleased to be a part of what I consider to be the revolutionary work that the town has decided to take on. So Jennifer and I are uh, an office of two. And um, I really see that she is the connector. If you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell, um, she is the person who knows this community well and helps to make the connections uh, that were really necessary and needed for our, for our office. Next slide, please. So the town adopted a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, and it is summarized here. Jennifer and I have used this to form the strategies and our vision for the office, a dedication to education and programming, a commitment to provide inclusive and equitable access to all the municipal services and programs, a commitment to an accountability for advancing DEI efforts, establishing partnership, and the recognition of all aspects of human differences. So our work is not limited to, um, to only work around race or gender, but really all human differences. Next slide, please. And um, actually, if you'll advance uh, until the slide is complete, oh, go back one slide, but there should be additional information on this slide. So you may need to, or something's missing. All right, well, I'm not sure what happened with that slide, but I'll just continue on. Uh, when I describe the work of the office, I generally say that our work is uh, falls into what I would say three broad categories. Internally, we're working with um, the town council, all of the departments, boards and committees. In fact, uh, Jennifer and I support four board, boards, the Human Rights Commission, the CSSJC, the DAAC, and I missing one, which I can't recall right at this moment. Human rights, DAC, oh, African Indeed. Heritage okay. and Reparations <laughs> um, Commission. So our work has an internal focus to it. In, in addition to the internal focus of working with all of those departments, boards, the town council and staff, we also have an external focus. And that external focus is our work with the community um, to foster relationships with nonprofits, with businesses, um, with community members and organizations. And then the third um, category, and one that personally really attracted me to the position, is our work around racial reconciliation and healing. All right, next slide, please. So there were seven. Uh, I guess parts of the resolution that the town passed, and I'll be addressing six of them, um, and Earl will address uh, the seventh one when he does his presentation. So one of the resolutions was to propose to the town council a plan for community visioning with a focus on public safety uh, and social justice. So the office began supporting this work in January by offering opportunities for community engagement we sponsored the National Day of Racial Healing, which was an opportunity for members of the community to gather together to talk about racial healing and racial reconciliation. Um, and we did that both um, as an event for staff only and as a, an event for um, community members. And since that time, we have been continuing to have opportunities to engage the community around uh, topics around DEI. And in fact, on May 20th, we'll have another community event on allyship. In addition, we've started to have some initial conversations with the consultant to envision what this work would, would look like 
on an ongoing sense. And our hope is to um, complete the procurement process where we will be able to hire that consultant at, who has outlined a plan for community and vision that um, for community vision that includes five separate parts. So the first is to meet with the department to talk about the structure and protocols that we would use for community of vision. The second part would be to train members of the town staff and community members to act as facilitators for these conversations. The third part would be to engage in those conversations broadly with select uh, community members, as well as different groups and organizations, I should say targeted, um, and then to envision that, that those groups would then put together a list of strategies and priorities. There would be a large gathering for all of the various groups to come together to discuss um, their work. And then the consultant has envisioned working with us to synthesize the work of the community to develop a strategic plan. You know, um, there was, I believe, some confusion about the description of community vision as it was reported in the report. Um, uh, so, and the confusion, I think, lied around whether only members of the staff would be engaging in this work. And that's obviously not the case. In discussions with the consultant, our prospective consultant, I um, asked if it would be permissible to have members of the staff trained um, as part of the train the trainer. In my eyes, that, see, that serves a dual purpose. It allows uh, the town to get the benefit of having uh, town staff trained in DEI principles and values. And then that staff is also able to act as facilitators for the larger community conversations that are proposed. Next slide, please. So the second um, part of the resolution was to propose to the town council a plan for the creation of a resident oversight board with a possible assistance from and hire an appropriate consultant to help with the development of that plan. An RFP for the resident oversight board was published on May 1st and proposals are due on May 16th. So um, a great amount of work has gone into um, pushing this initiative forward. Um, um, I guess it was probably December and January, I spoke with a number of different consultants to get a greater understanding about what would be needed uh, from, if we were to hire someone to guide us through this work. And then based on those conversations, based on my review of the work of the Community Safety Working Group, I uh, drafted according to town protocols, an RFP that was published in May. And as I uh, mentioned, those proposals are due on May 16th. So I think that we will very shortly be gathering um, a group of individuals to review those proposals. As part of the plan for the group to review the proposals, we propose that the members of that review team include the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Finance Department, a member from CRESS, a member from the Police Department, and members from the Human Rights Commission, as well as a member from the CSSJC. Next slide, please. The third request was to organize a review of the public safety protocols for responding to and handling public safety calls involving all residents, including minors, in order to recommend changes to those protocols if appropriate. This um, request has been included in the request for the R RFP for the Resident Oversight Board. Uh, I and other staff believed that it was premature to begin public safety uh, protocols in advance of having the Resident Oversight Board and um, at the same time that the town was in the midst of a, a search for a new police chief. It is um, my hope that during the RF, during the creation of the Resident Oversight Board and my expectation that there will be a complete review of the public safety protocols. And I 
I hope at the time that this is happening, we will have hired hopefully a police chief. And so there will be an opportunity for law enforcement to weigh in um, um, as well as for the community to, to weigh in on the public safety protocols. Next slide, please. Continue the work already begun and exploring options for a youth empowerment um, center. So the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and CRESS has agreed to hire an AmeriCorps member to spearhead the development of youth programming and services in both departments. Uh, so Earl and I have partnered to bring in an AmeriCorps volunteer. The volunteer uh, will work two days with our office and two days with CRESS. On the fifth day, uh, Friday, they're required to do work with uh, AmeriCorps. So um, it is our hope that this individual uh, who will begin in August will be able to work both with both offices as well as to collaborate with other community department, uh, partners about the workshops, activities, and presentations um, that will foster the work of Youth Empowerment Center. And I know that the town manager is also forming a working group to look at other initiatives around this area. Next slide, please. Provide training regarding racial equity rights and other options for training to employees and members of the public. So the office has already conducted a number of workshops for community members as well as staff and as well and has hosted um, numerous cultural events. The most recent one was a uh, cultural event was this past uh, Sunday for AAPI. We have partnered with the Human uh, Resources Department to provide workshops during the what will be likely the first uh, quarterly professional development day for town staff. We've also provided um, workshops to the DPW and the Amherst Police Department. Uh, the fire department is scheduled for later this month. And in June, the departments that are housed in Bangs, which are Health, Senior uh, Center, the Veterans Center, um, and Crest will all um, be engaging together in staff workshops around um, DEI and equity initiatives. Uh, on May 20th, we'll host the second of our community workshops on allyship. That will also be, be in the Bang Center. And um, many of you are, of course, very familiar with the ongoing cultural events that the office has sponsored with the Human Rights um, Commission. Next slide. So the communication plan ha, um, is one that's being developed by the communication director and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, the town has some earmarked funds from Representative Dobb that, that will allow for translation services. The town recently purchased three translation devices that it's going to test and pilot. Uh, some of the funds, the earmark funds, have already been used for translation services for some applications and for some uh, other events that the town has engaged in. And uh, the communications director and um, I, along with other department heads, will be trying to formulate a long-term communications plan that looks um, um, at language access and translation in a more broader sense. I think there might be one last slide for me. So, and so the, this is just an overview of the town's communication uh, landscape. So uh, the websites with Google have translation plugs in. There's a dedicated built-in online engagement plan, platform for informing uh, members of the community about town events that's Engage Amherst. Um, there are newsletters, uh, calendar alerts on the town website for both town events and community events, uh, weekly press meetings, um, a robust collection of public records. So we are 
um, engaged and trying to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to be engaged uh, in, the, in the community and to utilize the numerous uh, avenues for learning about the efforts of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as Crest and other offices on town. And I think that's my final slide. So Earl, do you wanna set, oh, yeah. up, set, set up your uh, slide deck and then you can start? Perfect. Hi everyone. Um, I'm, I can be wordy. I'm going to try to keep it to a minimum. So if I start to go too long, someone give me a look. Um, I'm incredibly grateful. I think it's important for me to start there. Um, I took this job because of the depth of the conversations this community had had um, and a feeling that folks meant what they said. Um, and, you know, my, my one year was March 21st, and I still feel like you mean what you say. Um, I don't know if there's a perfect path to to the kind of big goals we have, but um, I have felt happy to spend my time working towards it. Uh, next slide. So I really wanted to start with our mission statement. This is taken from the edicts of uh, the town council, as well as from looking at the CSWG um, videos to really understand the philosophy of some of those things. Um, and these are the core values that we, we think about every day. Um, everybody in this town is worthy of redemption, is worthy of hope, um, is worthy of not being represented by their worst day. Um, and we often meet people on their worst day. So this is an important one for us to remember. Uh, Trauma-informed care. It's important for me to say that I, I was supposed to be at Amherst Cinema right now um, for a trauma-informed Hampshire County film screening. Uh, Rome Cabrera is there doing probably a much more succinct job than I would. Um, and it's important to us that, to understand that uh, the way that trauma impacts people's abilities to move through the world um, matters and that it's worthy of being kind of honored and respected as, as we think about our work. Anti-racism, obviously, um, you'll see as we go through our training, we really infused all of our training period with anti-racism uh, trainings. Uh, really the, the idea of, you know, to, to understand the ways in which systems have historically worked to oppress people and understanding that we are an institution in its infancy. And that means that we can avoid some of those things getting into the roots of our work. So we think about that and talk about that often. Uh, being unarmed, um, I'll, I'll take, uh, one of the things we say is being unarmed doesn't mean unskilled or untrained or unprepared or ill-equipped. Um, it means that we don't show up with the tools to harm anyone. Um, and we find that to be a large advantage. Um, that should not be taken as a critique of any other public safety department. We are as different from everyone else as the police and fire department are from each other. We have a different uh, set of responsibilities and scopes, and we stick to those. Um, Person-centered, uh, our approach looks different for everyone who's in front of us. Their needs are different. The way that they envision the world, their hopes and dreams, their goals and aspirations are different. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't subscribe to any kind of one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we've worked with uh, a fair amount of folks and each of them have needed a little bit different things. Uh, and then collaboration. We are glad and excited to collaborate with anybody who uh, wants us to collaborate with them. Um, that has led to some adventures, um, but I think we've learned something from all of those things. Um, and there's still nobody we're unwilling to partner with. So uh, hopefully that doesn't change. Um, we really, this, this mission statement, is, I just wanna say first off, is not ordered by uh, importance. Um, all of these matter, uh, and depending on the situation and the thought process, uh, they may uh, they may be looked at in a different order, but all of them are equally important to the work we we do every day. Um, and we're we're glad to do it. All right, next slide. I like not having to hit the slide button. All right, sorry. Um, so introducing uh, you to the department, uh, that's me. Sorry, I don't take a good picture, but that's me, I promise. Um, Kat Newman, who ran the ambassador program in town. Um, brings such a profound understanding of engaging communities, of how you need to show up for communities so that you're not just kind of taking their time and attention, but but really understanding their needs and, and learning how to communicate with folks. Uh, Kavon Lord, uh, who played basketball at the high school, graduated from the middle school. Uh, Nick Yaff at Wildwood has a picture of his kindergarten class on his desk uh, as a child of this town. Um, continues to everyday work, uh, particularly with young men in the town doing some mentorship work that's that's really uh, one of a kind. Brittany Houghton, 
who attended UMass, was an RA there. Here, that's a tricky job. Uh, has worked in education her whole career and has, has uh, provided some valuable insights on working with students and, and the supports that they may or may not have. Vanessa Phillips, uh, who has lived in this town most of her life um, and brings a, a real savviness to working with seniors, which is a, a large part of our work is working with seniors, and we'll get into that more later. Uh, Kenneth Meikle, who you probably know as Q, um, who is uh, just one of the most uh, uh, engaging people you'll ever meet. He does a presence walk for us every day that uh, follows a really well-designed path through downtown that uh, allows us to engage with folks who um, who might not be on the kind of beaten path, who might be dealing with some things and um, to provide a kind of warm face and a friendly support and, and connection to resources. Uh, Rome Cabrera, who uh, is a political science major, uh, again, is talking at Amherst Cinema right now. I'm sure he's doing wonderful, and, and I'm certainly will watch this. Um, I watched him the other day engage with a, a, a couple who is undocumented around health insurance, and the thought I had was that if my family was in that situation, I sure would hope Rome would be there. Um, the way he treated those folks, the thoughtfulness, the, the warmth, uh, was, was, it was heartwarming. Uh, Tim DeRocher, uh, one of my favorite folks in the world, a young man who uh, is still a UMass student um, from the Berkshires, uh, brings a real understanding of, of what it's like to live in a rural community, uh, lack of access to resources, um, and is so committed. Uh, me and him were at the Common School this weekend uh, supporting an event there, and uh, he's. Yeah, I hope you all get to, to meet him. Chalo. Um, Chalo uh, just came back from Kenya, visiting some family. Uh, Chalo has been doing some wonderful work over at Crocker Farm, engaging with the community there. Uh, and Tia Atwell is our, our newest responder and has uh, just come out of training um, and continues to, to really uh, do good work, particularly at the library, engaging with the folks over there, which has been helpful for us. All right, so that's the whole team. I'm sorry, there's a lot of us, um, but each of them warranted a few words. So uh, next slide. So I wanted to talk about our training. Uh, I read in the, the, the response really uh, wanting to understand kind of how we thought about um, anti-racism and training around community things. Uh, we did nine weeks of training. Uh, we were at the Munson Library uh, working with outside agencies. We benefited from every department in town. Um, folks came down and explained what their operations were, the sorts of folks they interacted with, what their barriers were, um, and how we might be supportive in helping folks to uh, engage with those departments in a way that might feel supported and, and meaningful. Um, next slide, please. So these are the sorts of uh, modalities we went through, and I don't expect uh, you to read all of them or memorize them. Um, but the real piece I want to just note through all of this is that every line of this, there were conversations about um, historically underrepresented communities and how they engaged with those services. Um, some of these trainings came from folks at Amherst College or UMass. We engaged with social workers from Amherst. Um, we were able to get really fortunate to get trainings on uh, OCD and autism from two folks who live with those experiences in town, um, which really has shaped the way we've engaged with those communities. Um, and a thing that you won't see here that was a part of my personal training uh, was Jennifer Moyston. Um, as soon as I came into town, she really made it her mission to make sure that I saw where everyone was. I saw where the affordable housing was. We did barbecues at most of those spaces. Um, and one of the most important lessons I learned through that time was at Village Park. Um, we were doing a barbecue there. And, you know, I love Crest. Uh, it, it is kind of the thing I get to do with most of my waking days. So I, I sure am lucky to like it. Um, and, you know, understanding that being in communities is important, but people understanding why you're there that there was not an appetite for us to be like observing folks, that when we were places, we really needed to engage with people. Um, you know, this person really explained to me that sometimes when when there were uh, police in the neighborhood, it felt like she had done something even though she hadn't. And so it was really important as we've gone through the work to think about that, of how we engage with communities and how we do that in a way that doesn't make them feel like they have done something inappropriate. Um, all right, next slide. Um, these are examples of some of our, our kind of framing things. Um, you're going to hear me towards the end talk about some of the work we're doing with other departments in other parts of the country. That that conversation has started since the first day I got here, um, and I hope will continue as long as the department exists. We learn so much from other communities. 
motivational interviewing is a framework that I had not considered for the department until I talked to the folks in Akron, Ohio, who had piloted a team with motivational interviewing and found that not only were they able to engage with people in kind of more fluent ways, but they engaged with folks of color in ways that were more meaningful. They didn't juxtapose their own suppositions about how that person should end up or where they should be, um, that the modality allowed them to be more flexible with that. Um, and as we brought that on, we have found that to be true. Um, we brought in things on bias, institutional bias, um, and, and all of these things were really important for us as we move through. I just wanna to note to vicarious trauma, for us, it's really important. We see folks on really hard days. So making sure that responders have the tools to process the things they see um, and not let it impact their lives. Um, there's a lot of harm that help happens to people who are trying to be helpful, who aren't able to help themselves. So um, you'll see here kind of the framework of how we, we wanted the work to look. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I, I know we've already talked about models of growth, but I, I wanted to talk about the one I think about the most, uh, which is GROW. Um, it's setting a goal, looking at your current reality, your options or your obstacles, and then finding a will forward. For us, um, Crest is the fastest department in the country to operations. And while it is fast, it doesn't feel uh, it doesn't feel careless to me. Um, we set a goal, we set an achievable goal, and we achieve it. When we started, the goal was to hire a team. You'll note from other areas where people try to do this, hiring is hard. Hiring is really, really hard. Um, we we were able to get all of our responders out of one round of interviews. And that was because of the engagement that we had done with Jennifer Moyston before uh, Pamela came on. Um, half of our responders were recruited from events that happened in town. Uh, the old and young basketball game, um, the League of Women Voters event on a very hot summer day. Um, we met folks in those spaces. So they were committed to the work. Uh, when we started training, the goal was to get out of training. Uh, there are some departments that, that struggle to get out of training. Um, we, I, I knew that I was one person, and so I reached out to folks and received support from every level of the town, uh, not just town staff, but town residents. Um, people let me sit at their kitchen table and tell me about their, their challenges and what Crest would need to look like to address those challenges. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the, the warm welcome I received and the really honest talk I received from people in this community. People did not um, did not hide what they needed and, and that made us better at the beginning. When we came out of training, the, the goal was to find some work. We were able to do that pretty quickly. Um, and now our, our next goal is to begin taking 911 calls. And I think just the way we achieved every other goal, uh, we have set an achievable goal. We are engaged with our partners. We are doing the things we need to do that. Um, and I think the most important thing is there, we are unanimous in our department that there is a will to do this and that we will be successful. And I don't, I don't think there's any reason for me to believe we won't. Um, yeah, sorry. It's hard not to feel a little emotional about that. All right, next slide. Uh, so highlights of completed and ongoing cases. Um, volunteers have been huge for us. Uh, Jean Hartman, who is a town resident, uh, came to us through the tax write-off program as a veteran. Um, and he was supposed to work with us for, I don't know, maybe 20 hours. Uh, he's been with us for four months. We're building out a whole veterans uh, support program. And, and really, he came to us with a challenge. He was willing to put the work in and is helping us to address that in a meaningful way. Um, during the cold snap that kind of started our very expedited winter this year, um, we were able to help uh, nine folks find uh, shelter placements uh, with the assistance of Craig's door. Um, and and the the skilled uh, responders engaging with them in meaningful ways where they were and understanding that the solution that they envisioned for themselves might not be the vision we had. And so being willing to, to change gears as folks needed. Um, supporting other town activities, we've been lucky enough to be just about everywhere. If you've gone to a town event, you're probably a little sick of seeing us, but you'll, you'll see us there uh, in an ongoing way for a long time. Uh, meeting families, uh, things like Community Safety Day, um, those things have, have really mattered. Um, our public safety responsibilities, when folks call us with challenges, showing up, um, people being able to, to see a predictable outcome that we work to de-escalate situations, we are uh, able to resolve them ourselves, um, and often provide some follow-up so that the people who called us there can feel confident that, uh, that that's not the end of us supporting a person, that the crisis doesn't mean that the problems have been solved. So, um, the, we're next to the senior center. 
Uh, so we we have uh, a, a nice uh, group of seniors we engage with. Um, one of our responders has been walking a senior home every day, um, which that may not feel like a big public safety thing, but uh, not everybody has someone in their life to walk them home. And if you don't, that's a really big thing. And so we often talk about doing the small things right. Um, and if you've been to our office, you've met Brady and he's the sweetest dog in the world and he's a cat Newman service animal. Um, one of the, the greatest feedback I've ever gotten from a person, we were a government agency that's helping them um, and they meant that. Uh, and then working with families navigating challenges. Um, we are fortunate enough that some families have trusted us with their challenges and just come into the office and we've been able to support them. Uh, everything from parenting classes, um, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, everything from parenting classes to understanding where to get food and things for their, their family, um, being a meaningful part of their lives. Uh, sorry, next slide. So this is, uh, this is not all of our data. Uh, so since we've started, we've generated 570 reports. Those are engagements that we had with a person in which we were called and deployed out uh, and able to support them. This does not include every engagement activity we've done with folks. This doesn't involve every phone call. These are, we were called, we responded, we did an activity, we were able to, to come to some conclusion on it. Um, the, I'm sorry if you can't read the data on the right side. Um, I will. I will make sure folks get the PowerPoint. Um, this is 27 cases that we sent to UMass Donahue Institute. It was our first round of data we shared with them. Um, so this is our most representative data. Uh, comes from um, uh, 20 from April. Um, and what you'll see there, I, I know it's a, a little tricky to read, is that um, our the the communities we're working with are pretty varied. Um, we're receiving calls from different communities. Um, the types of calls we're taking are often assist citizen, which is really what we're looking for. It means uh, a person or a family member or a community member called us to support a person. Um, often these are defined by the person who makes the call, um, but there are opportunities for us to come out and be supportive to folks. Um, we've gone to places like the survival center, um, businesses in town, um, you know, places where people are to provide that support. Um, all right, next slide. Um, this is one I'm really proud of is um, that more often than not, when we engage with the person, we do have follow up. There is another appointment set. We are going to come back um, and, and provide more resources. Um, we think about the work as upstream. I know that 911 is an important duty for us to get to and we are speeding towards that. Um, but for us, a 911 call represents uh, a crisis uh, in someone's life. It, it represents a uh, a kind of failing of the preventative thing. So we really do try to do our work upstream as much as possible, um, being understanding that if people can't get their immediate resources needs met, that's more likely to put them into a situation in which they may need to do things that are um, not how they would want to behave or might get them into some trouble. Um, the fact that our responders are from the community, eight of our 10 responders lived, worked, or grew up here um, has been really meaningful because they often know the people we're working with. They have lifelong uh, relationships with them that we're able to, to understand. They also understand the unique challenges of Amherst. And I think it's important to note that being poor in a place where, where other people aren't is a particular type of trauma. It's a particular type of trauma when your pain is, is you see it, when I don't have anything and I see that you have so much, it really does magnify how unfair life can be. Um, and there are lots of research that that is a, uh, uh, an, an, a it's unique uh, traumatic experience. Um, so having responders who've sat on multiple sides of that equation uh, really allows us to understand where folks are coming from. Um, next slide. Okay, that's all my slides. Um, I, you'll note when we do these things, we always put Rome up there. If, if people have a question and they speak Spanish, they can reach directly out to Rome um, or myself, and and I think we'll take questions. Sorry if that. So yeah, I'm not going to say sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, we're, I'm practicing that. Thank you. Uh, we're as we agreed uh, in our Monday planning meeting, we're going to go move right on to the um, advice from the Community Safety and Social Justice. Committee and the Human Rights Commission. And so I'm going to turn to whoever is going to do that on their behalf. Allegra? Um, yes, I think I will be making remarks. And if anybody else has anything to add, please feel free. Um, so 
Thank you um, to Earl and to Pamela for your presentations and for all the hard work that you put into all this. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, okay. Um, and I just also wanted to acknowledge the members of the CSWG who are here both um, as now representative members on CSSJC, Ms. Pat and Deborah, as well as the co-chairs, Alicia Walker, our fine town counselor at large, and I do see that Brianna Owen is in the audience. She was also co-chair of the CSWG. So I would like to thank them for all the work that they do that we stand on. Um, so as part, I didn't prepare any slides, so I'm gonna talk and hopefully you can follow along in the packet if you need to. Um, so when, our committees met and were reviewing the report that was prepared in March. We wanted to reiterate the importance that all of this November 17th motion came out of the July 5th incident and what we saw as a failure to properly address the harm that had been caused to the youth that were involved in that incident. Um, so we had multiple meetings as um, Council President Grace Murr did allude to in August, October, and November of 2022 to determine how we could best find justice for the youth and move forward as a town. Um, and so in our response, we did discuss directly the seven things that had been outlined by the town council, but we also addressed what we felt was missing. So I'm going to discuss both our response to what is presented and what was not presented. Um, I think a main agreement that we had on many of the points was that a lot of work that had already been done was being replicated or being um, reintroduced with new consultants. And if we look back at the CSWG's reports, both part A and part B, as well as the LEAP reports and the 7Gen Movement Collective reports, we see a lot of, of the bones of what needs to happen in order to A, have a community visioning, B, have a resident oversight board, and C, organize a review of public safety protocols. So um, in terms of the community visioning, there is an extensive outline that was presented by CSWG and work with a consultant in the community. And we hope that there will be intensive participation of community members in, in moving that visioning forward. Um, in terms of the resident oversight board, Again, in the CSWG report part B, there is extensive research that is presented. And from our perspective, phase 1A through 1C that was outlined in the report presented by Ms. Young and the town have already been completed. So work should really start with 2A to 2C and implementing the board. Um, in terms of the review of ongoing public safety protocols, the LEAP report, which was then incorporated into the Part B CSWG report, does outline some very easy shifts in, in policing that would not cost any money and that would reduce the frequency of contact between the public and the police in terms of consent searches, pretext traffic stops, um, and and those are the two, you know, two, two of the main things, but then also in terms of 
just making sure that racial data is collected so that we're really understanding what is happening when police are stopping people. Um, so again, I think that was something that doesn't need to be reviewed, it needs to be implemented. Um, and I think that there are, again, additional things that we can work on, but I, I think the committees had significant concerns about waiting until the resident oversight board is seated to even start some of this work when a lot of it has already been outlined. Um, in terms of the CRESS department, the most important, well, everything is important, <laughs> but you know, I think there were a few things that we really wanted to stress. One is that CRESS cannot only depend on fundraising through grants. There should be increased funding through the town operating budget to meet the needs of the CRESS department. And that CRESS needs to be fully funded and fully staffed 24 seven based on the recommendations of the CSWG. Um, we, you know, we understand and appreciate that Earl has taken a very measured implementation strategy. And we've also heard from community members that they needed services in the middle of the night and CRESS, you know, isn't available at that time right now. So, you know, looking at the LEAP report again, there was also an analysis of when police calls happen and, and many of them are coming in after CRESS is already you know, closed for the evening. Um, so that was a concern that we wanted to highlight. Um, in terms of the Youth Empowerment Center, I'm gonna make a little editorial note. So I think the July 5th incident showed us that the youth in this town aren't being kept safe by the institutions that we believe are supposed to protect and serve them, um, mainly the police department. And there was a very disturbing report that came out yesterday in the graphic, which is the high school newspaper about staff at the middle school basically being transphobic and homophobic to youth. And there is an investigation happening, but this is another instance of an institution that's supposed to keep our youth safe and protected failing them. And so I think that speaks even more to the need for a youth empowerment center that is separate from the schools, separate you know, from the recreational department that's really led by the youth. So again, I think CSWG with 7Gen did some very strong research into the need for a youth empowerment center, and we should be implementing that. Um, in terms of the training regarding racial equity and rights, um, again, just making sure that there's ongoing required anti-racism training for all aspects of town and the community in general. And the training the trainers model, especially with marginalized committee, com yes, committees and communities within town to, to broaden engagement in the process um, would be important. And then the, the major point that we had around the communication plan was to include translation services as part of the plan so that we are reaching populations that we might not have reached in the past. And I, I am grateful to see that that was highlighted in the, in the presentation tonight. Um, so those are the seven issues that were in the motion that passed on November 14th, but there was an additional motion and variations that did not pass that directly spoke to the July 5th in instance. Um, and the families of the BIPOC youth involved in that instance, in that incident, have sent a open letter to the town government. Um, and I'm just going to read a few 
pieces of it because I think that it's important that we hear it. Um, so centering our Black and Latino youth and holding the town accountable. Much has been discussed and written about the nine youth that Amherst police detained on July 5th, 2022. Sadly, it has been not, it has not been enough. The experiences of the six BIPOC youth identifying collectively as Amherst Six and their families are experiencing profound grief, sorrow, and despair to this day from being repeatedly and relentlessly targeted by Amherst police. How the police have disrupted these young people's lives must be acknowledged and rectified. After the Human Rights Commission filed a complaint with the town and CSSJC called for a joint meeting with the town council, only did town officials finally address the injustice. The complaint led to a probe by the new director of the newly established Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Pamela Young, who acknowledged she had no investigative or authority over the police. The police investigated themselves. And quotes from the parents, the action of town leadership concerning the July 5th incident has been disappointing, overly sympathetic and pro-police. Town Council holding a series of private meetings with the police signals to the youth that blue lives matter more than black and brown lives. Our children face deep, lasting, and permanent harm. Financial compensation is acknowledgement and accountability to these youth whose childhoods have been mired by over-policing and racial profiling. No one deserves to grow up in a community where they understand their lives are at risk with the police. That's one parent. Another parent says the town of Amherst must be held accountable by way of financial compensation to our BIPOC youth. This action is a necessary and important step toward making meaningful progress to build trust with BIPOC communities. A third family says the Amherst six families will continue to speak with anonymity and through Ms. Ananibaku to protect against harm and retaliation. We know when BIPOC residents speak against police abuse, the stakes are greater. Anonymity is essential to protecting the safety of our families and the future of our BIPOC children in an age of internet Google searches and the harmful, unfair, and racist presumption of guilt, lawlessness, and dangerousness. Another says, the consequences of the extremely delayed meager and paltry response from local government and the attempts to bury and diffuse the violations of its officers translate to perpetuating trauma and a sustained assault on the dignity and humanity of our children. There is no resolution. We are telling our story again to underscore what justice looks like for us and to demand it. Justice is not last month's announcement of the police chief retiring from his post at the end of May, who offered pizza to make peace. Justice is not the private meetings organized by town council president Greismer and the police. Justice is not town manager Bachelman's apology that went to everyone. And finally, the dominant culture dictates where our money goes. We demand the town value the lives of BIPOC youth and their experiences. The town council ignored the pain of BIPOC youth and held secret meetings with the police to perpetuate racism. Um, so lastly, I'd like to read the recap of the event um, as told by the families. Two Armed and uniformed Amherst police officers, Lindsay Carroll and Tyler Martins, pulled into a low-income apartment complex parking lot and ordered nine teenagers in total to the ground. Some exited from their parked cars while others were coming from their apartment to check out what was going on. The teens were treated like criminals, worse even suspects, and criminals have rights. Police that night told these teens they had no rights, they lost their rights. The police found nothing to issue them a citation or a warning. Despite their innocence and despite no legal basis to keep them in custody, police continue to restrict the movements of the youth. The police chief who will be retiring in the weeks to come has said it was his duty, his conscious and moral obligation to only release the youth to an adult, even though they had every right to be freed from detention regardless of adult accompaniment. So, Again, from the perspective of CSSJC and HRC and from this perspective of the youth involved and the families involved in the July 5th incident, we need resolution to what happened and we hope that that will come.
we are going to move on to a discussion of the items. Um, and uh, Legra, you had asked whether other committee members wanted to add anything. Did you want to proceed with that? Uh, yes, if there's anyone from the committees who would like to add anything to what was said, please. And um, you go raise. ahead and call on your committee members that have hands. Oh, Deborah. Great, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, thank you, Allegra, for you know obviously going into uh, what we had come up with in terms of uh, CS CSJ CS CSSJC and too many too many uh, letters CSWG in terms of um, you know I'm one of the members from CSWG and um, HRC. Um, you know, and I want to thank obviously Earl and Pamela for the report, um, you know, and putting all the time into it. Um, but I guess for me, what I want to talk about really is, you know, because, you know, I've been at, at numerous, all of those meetings that you talked about, Allegra, that we met with the town council uh, since the July 5th incident. Um, you know, I've been at all those meetings. I've talked about it ad nauseum. And really, it's about trust, right? And right now, um, there's community residents in Amherst that really don't feel like Amherst really cares about them, right? And how can the town build this trust back? And, you know, and we've been talking about that and really, you know, crafting a way, a blueprint in terms of how to do it. And it started with the CSWG, right? And which I'm a, a, I was a member of where we did all of that work, all of that research, shared all of that information that basically had the how-to in order to put these things in place to avoid incidents like July 5th, where young people were mistreated and their families have gotten no, uh, no type of resolution besides uh, an apology from the town manager months down the road, right? No apology from the police chief, no apology from those two uh, who are involved, the police who were involved, the armed police who showed up there. Um, you know, no, no, no type of anything, right? And so CSWG had that blueprint to avoid that and it didn't. And then we had the incident and then, you know, just how it was dealt with was botched. And now we're, we're still deal, dealing with the repercussions. And now we have this report, right? And Allegra, thank you for, for going over this re the, the report. And also Pamela, I know you gave some updates. So I have, I have some questions, right? Um, so I know Pamela, you, you talked about a consultant. I would like to know who it is that, that you all are thinking about hiring in terms of the consultant, because that will make a, a very big difference in terms of the community visioning, right? Which is the first part that you all were talking about. Um, and, you know, really being transparent. I think it, it's about communicating, right? In terms of building trust, you need to communicate, you need to be transparent with uh, uh, the, the uh, Amherst residents, but those who are marginalized, right? Those that are being impacted, which we know are the BIPOC folks, because the ones, the youth that were there that were majority youth were, were BIPOC youth, right? Low income and, and, and being mistreated, right? So there needs to be transparency in terms of community visioning. The only way you're gonna do a community vision for healing is that is if you're communicating, you're sharing that information in multiple languages, you're going out into the community. It can't be just sharing it on websites and newsletters and so on and so forth where people don't have access to that, right? There's a lot of people that don't have access to that technology. So how are you gonna build trust? You have to go out to the people. I know seventh generation, D Shabazz, they did it when they were doing their research. They really went into the community and got the feedback from the community. That's what we need. We don't need the, the same old, same old people at the community vision, the ones that usually show up. We want to hear from folks that we don't hear from all the time. We wanna hear from the marginalized voices, the ones that are silented and are, are silenced, right? So that's one, we need to kind of, you know, get more information in terms of truly how is that, that gonna take place. Um, for the, the uh, resident oversight board, I know um, Pamela, you stated that, that you all already put an RFP to hire a consultant. 
that went out May 1st and it goes up until May 16th. I mean, again, that needs to be you know, more transparent. Maybe you did share it for, with CSSJC. I, you know, maybe I missed the meeting or something like that, but I need to know what that is because again, as Allegra stated, if we're gonna go back to recreating the wheel about the resident oversight board, things that, would, that CSWG had already put in their report, then we're wasting time. What we need to do is really put the board together. That needs to happen yesterday. So we need to go to the CSWG portion that really talks about the structure and what needs to be put in place. So if we're gonna start talking about the whys and, and things like that, that really is not gonna get us to where we need to be. So I'd really be interested in, in seeing what the, um, the uh, proposal uh, looks like for this RFP, because we need to hit, hit the ground running in regards to, to the resident oversight board. Then um, in terms of the public safety protocols, I mean, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that, that, you know, that the town is waiting until there's a resident oversight board to begin looking at the uh, public safety protocols. Again, I'm talking about trust. Why wouldn't we begin to, to look at that beforehand? Right, and, I, and I'm posing this question and I want a response, right? Because the thing is, is we saw what happened with July 5th, right? The botched mishandling of the public safety protocols. And so now we're going to wait <laughs> until a, the Rob is put in place, resident oversight board, short, you know, Rob is put in place um, so that we can continue to have more incidents, so that we can continue to have, you know, more, uh, people hurt and young people and, and so on and so forth hurt. No, we need to, to, to start looking at the, these, these safety protocols. And we need to really look at how we, we handle when incidents happen, right? Because if there had been an apology early on, a lot of this would have been, uh, um, you know, short circuited as opposed to going through this long, arduous, stressful, really hurtful process for the young people and their families. Who are impacted on July 5th, right? And, and, and all other BIPOC folks, right, myself included, that, that feel afraid, right, because of the process that occurred, right? So, um, and then, you know, someone mentioned the fact that there's going to be a new chief of police process. I mean, that needs to be transparent. That needs to be transparent. Again, building trust with the community. How are you going to build trust with the community when we don't even know what's going on? You can't just go and hire someone quickly and you know, a pivotal position like a chief of police without making sure that everyone is involved in the process. If not, you're only gonna be creating more problems. Then we move on to uh, workshops, you know, well, youth empowerment. The youth empowerment, um, the, we, again, CSWG put a whole lot of research, a whole lot of information, which none of it has been really looked at. Um, but also the only people that really need to be consulted, I saw that there was going to be staff and so on and so forth and all these adults from different committees. No, it's the young people that need to be consulted. That's the only ones that I, I need you all to consult with in terms of the youth empowerment. This needs to be a youth empowerment, youth led with adults, yes, yeah, support and structure, but youth led, youth focused, and the youth should be the ones talking about what they need for the youth empowerment center as opposed to a bunch of adults from a bunch of agencies that, you know, really make no sense, okay? Um, and then, you know, I know we talked about workshops and cultural events. Uh, Pamela was talking about that in, in her um, report out. Um, I just wanna know, you know, what have the police attended in terms of anti-racism, um, you know, anti-bias? I know they go through, you know, state mandated trainings that they check off, I get that. But I, I am talking about the extra training, right? Especially since what, what transpired on July 5th. What else has happened that are mandated for the police and their entire staff to attend as a result of what transpired on July 5th? Question, that's a question, that's another question. Hopefully people are taking down the, the questions and I'm asking. Um, and then lastly, no, not lastly, two more points. Cress, um, as Allegra stated, 24 seven and the funding needs to be from the town. It needs to be long-term. And I really wanna know, you know, whether at this point the police are not responding to nonviolent behavior, to nonviolent behavior, because that's what CSWG put in their report, right? 
is for the police not to respond to anything that was nonviolent. Again, if that had happened, right, in terms of then July 5th wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have occurred. So I, I wanna know, you know what's occurring there. And then lastly is what we've talked about, which is really the young people and the families. What has been done to make them whole? What has been done to rectify what they've been through? Which really is the crux, right? Of, of this whole thing is to avoid Amherst residents, right? Which BIPOC people are part of the Amherst residents from being impacted in this way. So I wanna hear a question, right? How are the young people and uh, their families gonna be made whole? And, and like Allegra stated, not by going to pizza with the police chief, but actually made whole. Thank you. Um, thanks, Deborah. Um, Michelle and I have uh, decided that it, at this point, we are going to take a five minute recess. And when we come back, we'll go back through the seven items. And Deborah, at that point, will be an opportunity as we come to each of the items to get responses from uh, Earl, Paul, um, whomever, uh, Pamela. Uh, to each of the questions you have raised. So we'll have an opportunity for other people to raise questions and also ask for those. So uh, it's 7.54, we're going to re reconvene at eight, okay?
As you return, please turn on your video. As you return, please turn on your video. So at this point, um, Michelle Miller is going to facilitate the conversation and the listening and responses. So Michelle, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Lynn. Um, and as Lynn said, when we got started um, in our joint planning meeting, we agreed that we would go through each of the seven items one by one. And we'll open it up for comments, questions, uh, discussion. Um, I will begin by taking members of the CSSJC and HRC first um, until uh, for each of the items. Um, and then we'll go to counselor comments and questions. So starting with community visioning, I wanted to come back to Deb. I know Deb had a couple questions in there um, and some comments about community visioning. So um, we could start with you, Deb, and then we're gonna go to Ms. Pat. Um, so right now we're um, in uh, the community visioning recommendation. You want me to like restate what I had said before? Yeah, if you'd like to restate the questions that you had um, for Pamela, um, Paul, or and or Earl, and then um, they'll have the opportunity to respond, and then we'll we'll go from there. Okay, sure. So for me, um, the question I have around that is, uh, Pamela, you have stated that there's you know a consultant or, or maybe someone that that you all are thinking about. So I wanted to to know who that was um, to get an idea because, like I said, one of the main things mm -hmm. is really transparency. Mm -hmm. Um, with the community so that the community knows what's going on. And then uh, my other um, points around the community visioning is really making sure that uh, we are outreaching to those who are marginalized. Um, you know, we need to go into uh, the neighborhoods and really making sure that we're communicating in, in the different languages and really uh, truly doing the outreach. Because if not, we're going to get the same people that always um, come to these meetings. And then really we're not getting, you know, the true voices of those who are you know, who are being impacted, who a lot of those communities are the communities like the ones from uh, the young people who are uh, uh, in the July 5th incident. So, you know, I really want to know what are the steps um, that we've, you know, that the town, so the town manager, whomever can, can, can respond to this, 
um, to really outreach. And I also made the point that seventh generation, when we hired them to do um, the research that they did uh, for our um, you know, work with the CSWG, you know, they were able to go into the community. And so they would be a resource in terms of how to do that work. You can't just be on the periphery, you know, on the exterior. You have to go in and really um, get the voices that have been silenced and, and mm -hmm. are not heard on, on a daily basis. Thank you, Deb. So yeah, a Paul and Pam, Pamela, if you wanted to respond to Deb's questions and comments. Yeah, so I, I think the first thing that I have to say is that we um, have not begun the procurement process. So I can't state publicly the identity of, you know, who the consultant is, but in the report that um, was provided to the town council, the CSG, uh, SJC, and um, to the HRC, I, I do state that we have had some preliminary conversations with Dr. Barbara Love. Um, so uh, the office in the town is mindful um, of the desires of the community safety working group. And um, so we envision having a consultant that would meet with the needs of the community and um, also would follow the uh, visioning that was outlined in the work that Dr. Love did for the CSWG. And, and then what about the other, um, can anyone respond to how you all are going to do the outreach to actually get people to come to these visioning sessions? People who are from the marginalized um, communities and, and voices that we don't hear on a day to day. Right. So. Once we've selected a consultant and, uh, and that person has been identified, it is our expectation and goal that we will be reaching out to uh, marginalized communities, targeted communities, the, you know, to the um, community members through a number of different avenues. So it is, the goal and expectation is that there will be an attempt to have broad representation um, at these events. Thank you, Pamela. Paul, did you want to add anything to that before we go to Ms. Pat? Uh, no, I think I think uh, Pamela hit all the major points. And I just, I, it's important to note that when we expend public funds, we have to follow procurement. And that's why Pamela is talking about putting the RFP together. Um, we have had conversations with Dr. Dr. Love uh, but again, it's, it has to be a procurement process that we follow, and that's what's that's the next step for this. Yeah, and and I understand that, Paul. So thank you. Um, I do I do get that, and I was asking that question because yeah, because during Pamela's presentation, she has said that you all had some conversations with a consultant. So, you know, for for me, like I said, it's about building trust. So you might as well just put it out there. And and even though you all have a process to go through, which we all understand, but it's better to just be right up front about it. You know what I'm saying? Because that is only going to build more trust with the community. So the last thing that I have to say in terms of the responses that you know you and Pamela gave is just that you know, please, you know, uh, let CSSJC know what's going on in terms of the outreach and the consultant process, you know, every step of the way, you know, so that we are able to chime in, we are able to help out in terms of the outreach. Because again, if, if, if at the end of the day, we end up showing up, because, you know, I'll, I'll go to these visioning sessions, if I'm available, and I know about it, I'll be there. And then if I end up seeing the same people that go to everything else, I'm not going to be a happy camper at that point. So, so let's let's work together on this. Thank you, Deb. Okay, we're going to go to Miss Pat, and we're still um, staying with visioning here. So, good evening. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I had no idea the format of this meeting tonight. So I would not be speaking on visioning, if that's okay with you, um, Michelle. Um, Ms. Pat, you're free to speak. Um, if you're speaking um, absolutely um, in, in expansion of Allegra's remarks, please go ahead. Okay. So first I wanna thank everyone who have uh, made presentation tonight. 
and folks who are in the audience. Um, I want to speak to the elephant in the room and that's um, racism and retaliation and power control. That's the reason why we're meeting multiple times. If what happened to in July 5th incident, if they were all white kids, middle class, this issue would have been resolved a long time ago. And so our town government leadership have decided to disrespect the youth and their families because they are uh, people of color. Some of them are low income. They don't matter. Let's, let's look at who is making decision in our town. White, powerful people. And if you're not white, if you want to, you know, get things done to benefit you, you have to be a status quo. And here where we are, as much as we're doing great things in our town, but Ames is a town of two tells. We have people who are really suffering because of the actions of our town government. And when people speak up, you get retaliation, you get targeted, you get disparaged, you get silenced. And we're talking about visioning, we're talking about peace, we're talking about community engagement. A group of six BIPOC families approached me to be their spokesperson. And I've been disregarded by the town government leadership. Why? Because I'm a black woman. That's the only reason, ignore and ignore, it will go away. This is not going to go away. Why haven't we resolved kids who have been targeted multiple times? It wasn't just the July 5th incident. Some of these kids have been targeted since when they are in middle school. And it's easy for our town government leadership to make these families' kids whole. Our town is like a corporation, a company. And each company has insurance for liability. When your staff screws up, that's what you do insurance for. But the town manager and the town council president decided not to approach me. And yet every time at the town council, people talk about community engagement, reaching out. Who are you guys reaching out to? People who go along with your status quo or people who are afraid to speak up or people who are afraid to get retaliated. This is not just about me. This is about what is happening to BIPO community in our town. If we're really, really serious about making progress, we need to think about some of you, I don't want to mention your name, that are serving on town council right now. I will, you know, I hope you will reflect whether you are representing everyone. I know last year when I said the town, the um, police chief to think about resigning, I was silenced. And what happened now? What is happening in our school system is the same internal promotion. Nothing has changed. Somebody moves on, another status quo goes in and kids are hurting and our, our youth are hurting in the school system. We can't be just meeting every time and talking. It's not sustainable. People look at the budget for 2024. It will tell you a lot about what the powerful people in this town value. Crest program was only given additional 20K and the DI, DEI like $6,000 and that is called you know, fully funding. And yet we have the same budget 
for two police uh, vehicles, four police officers being trained. What are we doing? Are we really, really serious about change in our town? I don't know what to make of this meeting, except to call it another show. Each time we have this type of joint meeting, it's, it's show to me. I will stop. I hope I have a chance to speak again. But I hope that these kids and their families will be made whole. Otherwise, the next, the next step will be litigation. I am the spokesperson for the group. I'm not going anywhere. So you guys have to make it whole or there will be no peace in our town. There will be no unity in our town because you can't have all that when some segments of our community are hurting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And I, I just I wanted to say that it is our intention um, and when when Lynn and I talked about this meeting um, and others that we really want to be in listening mode here. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the town council um, was unable to meet to discuss Pamela and Paul's report. Um, so I understand that we have counselors who may have questions. Um, but before we go um, to Council Rooney and Councilor Pam, I do want to ask if there are any members of the CSSJC or the HRC who would like to make comments um, about the community visioning portion. Councillor Miller, I apologize for interrupting, but Councillor Walker is in the, the, the audience. Oh, okay. I am not seeing, let me see. You know what, I'm going to, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to do something different so I can see. Um, all right, I think we're moving Councillor Walker back over. Excellent. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to go to Ronnie. Ronnie? Mission. Shall I? Uh, yeah, uh, Philip, okay. did you? Okay, <laughs> great. Philip, Philip, did you want to go first? No, I just wanted to make sure that you got acknowledged, sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, so about the visioning thing, and in some respect to this whole thing, when I started reading all of this, um, mostly to educate myself, because I'm fairly new in town, even newer to the HRC, one of the things that was really striking to me is how old these documents are. You know, they've been, these studies have been going on for a long time. And I have to say, you know, like to refer to the back to the question of trust, why isn't there trust? Because you all, the town council, somebody in authority selected the CSWG, selected, appointed, whatever the CSSJC. These people are selected because they're experts. And they did their work. And when I looked at the seven gen report, I was astounded. It's an ex excellent report. It's like one of the best qualitative studies that I've seen. And in this, these reports is a lot of data. So when I look at the visioning proposal, my first question was why aren't some of these experts part of the core visioning team? Like by that, I mean the team that decides what is the framework that is going to be used to do the visioning? Why aren't some of these experts part of it? So I'm also wondering why isn't all that work that's already been done incorporated? And I think that's where the trust comes in, for me anyway. It's sort of like there's all this work that was commissioned, but it seems that it's being ignored. And there's it's just a waste of our money to start over, uh, as I speak as a taxpayer here. I really wish that this, when they sit down, the, the consultant and the uh, DEI sit down to talk about how are we going to approach visioning? I really don't think it's realistic for the DEI to suggest that somehow they're going to go out to all these marginal communities. Uh, these other groups have done that. So I think that some, I would really like to see that core team not just the consultant and the DEI, but the core team sit down and think strategically about what added value is required for visioning, you know, bu building on what's already been done. 
maybe there's a feeling that something new needs to be done. Okay, what is that extra instead of doing the whole thing? So I would really like to see that. The other point I wanna make about trust is this RFP process. I know there's an RFP process, but it sounds to me like the RFP was already written and in fact made public without drawing on all this expertise because these people are the ones who are going to tell you like what should go in the RFP. It's not about town procedures, but if you come in after the RFP is written, then there's no point almost. And we all know that who do contracts like I do uh, as a business person. So I really, I don't, obviously you cannot recall the RSP, RFP now, but I just heard about it and I'm sort of thinking, well, how do you put the content to the RFP if you don't have these experts that have the information that will tell you what should go in an RFP? So I think I'm coming back to why I'm starting to understand why there's a lack of trust and an explanation from the town council about why don't we build on what's been done would really help me a lot and maybe it would help others. Thanks. Thanks, Ronnie. And so I heard a question in there um, that maybe Pamela and or Paul would like to respond to. Um, the question was whether there would be folks in the CSSJC who would be part of the core work on the visioning. Um, and I also wanted to clarify, and Paul, please correct me if I'm wrong, the RFP that has gone out has been for the resident oversight board and not for the visioning. Just to clarify that piece, Ronnie. Um, so I don't know, Pamela or Paul, if you wanted to respond. Um, I won't repeat that, but I guess it would it would apply when we get to discussing the resident oversight board as well, because they gave very detailed guidance on what that should constitute. Absolutely. So, so I, I think my response is um, the same that I that I gave, which is that um, we are at the very beginning of the procurement process for the community visioning there it has not started yet um, but there has been preliminary conversations with dr barbara love who um, was the individual who was identified by those groups as the ideal candidate to lead the community through the community visioning and whose model was the model that was promoted in those documents. So all of that advice has been taken into account. And if I can add something, Michelle? Of course, yeah. So, and just to, so people may, many, most people in the room know who Dr. Love is, but we, I've relied on Dr. Love. Uh, Dr. Love um, was the key, along with Sid Ferreira, was the key person who interviewed the candidates to serve on the CSWG. Uh, and they, they also served uh, as the interview team for the CSSJC. Um, and as a sense that um, they had a better handle on how these committees could best represent the community. So oh, throughout this uh, engagement, Barbara, Dr. Love has been donating her time in terms of helping us to form these groups. So she, and I feel like she has a lot of credibility. She has been supporting, you know, much of the RFP that was developed uh, came from the work that was already done. And so that's how th those RFPs get built and consultation with people in the field. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, is uh, I see a hand from Deb. And then if anyone else on the visioning from the CSSJC or HRC would like to comment or ask questions, please also raise your hand and then we will go to Councilor Rooney and Councilor Pam. Deb? I just have a quick quick point. I mean, I think, you know, Ronnie, you made such incredible points in what you said, but I think it doesn't, I know that you can make those points again for, for the Rob um, RFP. I think what you stated is applicable to before you do the RFP for the visioning consultant, right? that you go and consult right and you are transparent about what it is that you're going to be putting in there so that it captures everything that the community wants because you know as ronnie stated you have people like us right in cssjc and hrc and, and uh, the reparations group that is in tune with the community so you go to these groups 
to get an idea, right, of what it is that should be in this RFP so that you can get to as close as possible what the community is looking for. And then you put it out there as opposed to just putting out an RFP and letting us know afterwards. And then, you know, it's, it, it, it becomes very confusing. And again, you know, in terms of building trust, we feel like the, the trust hasn't been built. I'm sorry, we need to ask somebody to mute their background because yeah, there is an yeah. enormous Chief. amount of other, other noise. Maybe that did it. Okay, I'm sorry, Deborah. Just people couldn't even hear you. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just saying that in terms of that, like with the RFP, just quickly, just to say that what Ronnie said really is applicable and just make sure to, um, you know, contact members from HRC, C CSSJC, as well as reparations to make sure that whatever is going to be in that R RFP is what the community is looking for, as opposed to putting out that RFP. And then it, it comes, it becomes something that we really, you know, didn't, you know, we weren't looking at, you know, unless you went and looked and, and took verbatim what CSWG put in their reports, right? So, so I think that that's those steps, if you're taking those steps, it can start to little by little um, create some of the trust that, that, that we're talking about. Yes, thank you, Deb. Okay, anyone else from the CSSJC or HRC? All right, so Council Rooney. I think I'm now going to be a little bit of a broken record, but my initial reaction when I heard the discussion about the RFPs is that in fact, it is vital to go to stakeholders to make sure that it has been scoped properly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that we are moving forward on the resident oversight board. Um, and I think it's great that you have a good, uh, a good uh, and trusted source of information for something like that, but it doesn't make sense to me that um, an RFP for something of these natures for the different for the different services that we're looking for, uh, in fact, don't get double checked by all of these engaged and um, and and critical stakeholders. So you've heard it now four times. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Pam. Okay. So I, I do want to speak. I have some very detailed things to speak about the Youth Empowerment Center, but I believe this is not the time. So I have a couple very quick points. Number one, is Alicia supposed to be in this meeting? Because I can't see her. I, I was told that we were told she was in the audience. She was going to be brought in, but if she, she is... She's on the second page for me right now. Um, page. Thank sorry. you, thank you. Good, thank you, I feel a lot better. Okay, so um, there were two points of clarification I wanted from Allegra. Um, I wasn't sure if I heard them correctly. Okay, um, and I may have misheard you, Allegra. So one of them was, did you say that the police told the young people to get on the ground? Because I hadn't heard on the ground before. Because that presents a different picture than sitting down on a curb to me. Um, yes, I. So this again, part of the letter that was written did involve more of the family's understanding of what happened that night. So it does say. Um, pull, the officers pulled into a low income apartment complex parking lot and ordered nine teenagers in total to the ground. To the ground, because it's not that if that's true, okay, really puts a very strong light on things. Um, and the other thing I thought you said was that some of the students had been continued, were targeted after this incident by the police. And again, I want clarification on that because I hadn't heard that before. Can I respond? Yes, please do. 100%, I heard directly from some of the kids. This has been happening for several years. So the July 5th incident isn't an isolated incident. And after the incident, the APD continued to harass these kids. Yes, 100%. Okay, thank you. And, and I then saw the kids were, the, the kids were also asked to stay on the ground. I heard it from the kids directly. Yes. 
right. So right now, I say I have some very detailed things I want to say about the Youth Empowerment Center, which I think could go a lot towards creating some new trust. Uh, but right now, I just want to point out that Ms. Pat was asked by parents to represent them. They asked her to do that, I'm assuming, because they trusted her, because she's strong, because she will speak to power. So it doesn't mean she'll always be the sweetest woman in the room, okay? So if I wanted somebody to speak for me and my kids, I would go to a strong woman. Now, I understand that sometimes people don't like strong women, but I think we just have to get over it, okay? Because they went to her, they are not here. We don't see them, they're not in the audience. They asked her to please do something to redress what happened to my kid, which has made my life and their life very, very difficult because they now feel not safe in their own town. So I think that we have to give her the respect they asked her to represent them. There is nobody else that says they're representing them. So I have to believe that when she says that, she's telling me the truth because I've heard nothing to the contrary. So I, I just think that we need to have a little more respect for the wishes of the parents and for the person they chose to be their spokesperson. And I have not seen that. I have not seen that these many months. I have seen just ignoring her, just completely ignoring her. And that is very upsetting to me. That's it for now. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay, is there anyone else um, that would like to make comments or questions right now on the community visioning? If not, we'll move on to number two, which is the resident oversight board. We have had some comments already, um, but I welcome comments and questions now, again, first from the CSSJC and then from uh, uh, and the HRC and then from members of the council. And I see Deb's hand. Please, Deb. Yeah, I, I don't know. Can you all hear me? Because I think I'm freezing a little bit. So that's why I took out my video. Can you all hear me? Yes, you're still good. Yep. Okay. So, um, you know, just to restate, because again, me too, like, like, like Ms. Pat, I wasn't sure what the, 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 how everything was going to run. That's why I, I gave my whole recap in the beginning. But I really am interested in finding out more about what is the RFP that went out for the Resident Oversight Board. Um, that went out on May 1st, because like I said, if it included a lot of the work that CSWG did, um, which was in the report that that um, the town manager has sent out, which was basically um, phase 1A through phase 1C, then we're really wasting our time because that was all included in what CSWG had done already. And really we need to go to the phase 2A, which was in that report, which is oversight implementation. We need to just put the oversight, the resident oversight board in place. So I, I'm really interested in knowing what that, that RFP had in there and why it is, and maybe, like I said, maybe I missed the meeting, why it is that CSSJC or HRC or, or, or other groups weren't tapped to really look at the RFP so that then we could put, put that together and put that out. You know, the, in terms of building trust with the community, we need to have a board that the community is gonna see as unbiased, objective, separate from the police, that they can go to and that their complaint is gonna actually be heard and really looked at and investigated um, you know, objectively without there being you know, any type of pressure or um, you know, influence from the town in terms of decisions being made by this board. You know, there needs to be stipends for the board members, everything that we had put in CSWG report. So I'm really interested in finding out what this RFP um, stated, because, you know, it, it, it will be a problem if we're starting back to ground zero when we spent all this money, when the town spent all this money, and we put all this, all this information together for the board in the CSWG report. Thank you, Deb. Paul <laughs> or Pamela, would you like to respond to that? So I, I can begin the response. So once again, I followed the protocol for the RFP process that is um, utilized from the town. But the very first um, part of the scope of services in the RFP, which is 
quoted in the report that was provided to town council and to both boards. The, the very first bullet point says, acknowledge and expand the work of the community safety working group. So that is the basis of the, of the work for the RFP. Uh, um, and in addition to that, in the development of the RFP, they spoke with uh, experts in the field who are um, from, I'm gonna mispronounce the name of the group, but it's NACALI, it's the National Association of Civilian Law Enforcement Oversight or something um, along that nature, which was also cited in the CSWG report as the expert on this area. So for, for those um, um, experts, I had conversations with them about the technical aspects of creating um, the resident oversight board. Uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't even begin to try to summarize everything that's in the RFP. I, you know, it's a pretty complex document. Um, and this was my first time going through the process. It took actually quite a bit more time than I expected, but it, uh, it explicitly states that it's built upon the work of the community safety working group. And if I can add uh, that document, the RFP is on the town's website. It's publicly noticed at the state level and, and wherever it, it, anybody can pick it up and it's available for your review. Um, when it goes, uh, it goes onto the town procurement bulletin board. So it's available to anyone who'd like to review it. Um, so, and so I think Pamela did a terrific job in pulling that together and, and recognizing also that there, the world was a little bit different than the report in the sense that uh, the post commission is now in existence, which it's a peace officer, something what exactly stands for, but this will be the first resident oversight board that is will be formulated after that has been created. So we think that our experts need to really interplay our oversight with the state's oversight that they have instituted. So can I can I follow up? I mean, I, I get I get all that. However, I'm still not convinced in terms of why it was that it, this wasn't brought to us before the RFP uh, went out. Um, you know, I, I get it that you talk to, you know, some experts in, 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 in oversight creation, oversight board creation, as well as you have that overarching sentence that it's going to expand on CSWG. But I, that, the, you know, and I am, I'm going to look, Paul, I am going to look at what the RFP actually looks at, because like I said, I hadn't looked at it before. I didn't even know it was, was it had gone out. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, our groups are there for a reason, right? For us to be utilized so that then you don't get backlash, right? <laughs> so if you had come to us beforehand and kind of run things by us, you know, it would actually go a lot more smoother than now I'm going to look at it. And then if it, if it doesn't have the things that I think there should be, now it's going to be the backlash. And then here, here we go. Deborah's the bad person. Deborah's the, you know, the you know, as, as, you know, as pa uh, Dorothy Pam was talking about, you know, the, the angry black woman's talking again and so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we're talking about trust. We're talking about transparency. So come to us before, you know, and be transparent, even if you're going to not like what you hear, right? But it's better you hear our feedback beforehand than then hear the feedback afterwards. And then you, you, you try to put us in a category to try to like delegitimize us, right? And so it, it, it just doesn't need to happen. And then the community sees that, right? And, the and then how is the community gonna trust? So yeah, now post, post RFP being, being looked at, I'm gonna look at it and we're gonna discuss it and then you'll be getting our feedback. And just to clarify, Paul, I did take a look um, on the town's website, um, and it does ask for some information in order to see the RFP. Is it true that anyone can go ahead, um, just so for the folks here and for the, the public, can put the information in there and then it's a, become, it's a publicly available document? Yes, any, anybody can request the document. Great, thank you. That's that's good clarification, um, Miss Pat. So, for me, for the resident oversight board, my struggle is transparency. 
Um, I know that this is, I don't know if it's this year or last year, like the police union negotiation. I don't know what the outcome is, but CSWG, we did uh, point out some concerns uh, around uh, some of police policies. And we were told that, they, you know, it's police union negotiation is coming up. I understand that the DEI director wasn't involved in that negotiation because she was getting on board. So I don't know how all this fits into creating resident oversight board without the public knowing if there are any progress made with the police union. So I would like uh, the town manager to respond to that. Is there somewhere on the town website I can go to, to look at um, any changes, compromise with police union? Paul, please. Sure. Uh, so we do not have a successor agreement with the police union. Uh, so that those are, that's still in negotiation. So is the DEI director, would, be, uh, would she be involved in the negotiation? She's, since she's going to be involved with a resident oversight at some point. In the, in the development of resident oversight board? The HR director and the town attorney conducts the negotiations on behalf of the town. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, and I'm gonna go to Elizabeth and then to Allegra. So first I need to apologize. I've had a really long day and I'm fading fast. And I wanna say this before I fade off and you don't get to hear from me. Um, we're talking about a lot of initiatives here, some that are being put in place and some that we're considering putting in place or should have put in place in the past. Anybody who knows me knows I'm all about the youth. So given that at the high school, there's a principal advisory committee, the youth get to meet with the principal and the lens of the students is spoken to him or her about things that are going on and what affects them and how some changes can be made. In the Human Rights Committee, we have two youth. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the CSWG, there was a youth. So when we're considering some of these things, and Deborah spoke about it before when she was talking about um, the Youth Empowerment Center, but how come we don't have somebody, oh wait, the um, school committee, there's a youth on the school committee. They don't have voting power, but they get to be in on the discussions, right? So what? why can't we have our youth involved with every one of these steps? Especially since a lot of this come from the um, youth feeling a different way or some kind of way about our town, right? So how come we don't have a youth leader on the town council? They get to sit in on town council meetings, Maybe when you have a discussion, they get to weigh in from the youth perspective before decisions made. And I just want you to be thinking about that because we need to be uplifting our youth. We need to uplift each other. So I'm so happy that Ms. Pam said what she said about women, especially those that look like me, when we have, because when we're soft-spoken, you don't hear me. Mm -hmm. And when I get loud, then I'm that B word. Right. Yeah. So I want um, us to consider when we're doing some of these initiatives, when we're looking at some of these things we want to put in place, making sure that our youth are counted in all of these decisions and not just because we are making decisions for them, but because one, two or five of them was involved in the entire process. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Allegra. Um. It's hard to follow what was just said, um, but I, I second everything that was just said. And also um, in terms of the oversight board, I just wanted to point out on the response to the original report point eight. Um, and this was a point that there was a lot of negotiation around, but it says the oversight board must be empowered to ensure accountability of the APD through effectual enforcement and investigative mechanisms. And I mean, I think this is what gives it teeth and that's you know, really important And going back through 7Gen and CSWG reports, 
they stress the importance of subpoena power. And I think that's something that has continued as part of the conversation with our committees. So I just wanted to highlight that point. Thank you, Allegra. Um, are there any other members of the CSSJC or HRC that would like to ask questions or comment um, on the resident oversight? Okay, and any counselors that would like to ask questions on the resident oversight or comment? Okay, so I'm not seeing any, just double checking over here. Okay. All right. So we are going to then move on to there is one hand. Oh, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Lynn. Pat, please. I, Sorry, I, I got it up late. I just want to say how important it has been to add youth and uh, Elizabeth Haygood's statement about youth and other people. I think it is critical. Um, and I would like to see them involved in a resident oversight committee as a, uh, as a member and as a voting member if possible. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Um, all right, so we are going to move on to number three, which is um, the public safety protocols. So again, if there are any comments or questions or discussion um, for this, um, and yes, Deb, I see. So um, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, yeah, again, I just want to restate this one because like I said, and I'll use the word again, I'm flabbergasted about the fact that with a report from the town, um, it is just a, a holding pattern. It just says that it's gonna wait for the resident oversight board to be in place in order to address the pub, public safety protocols. And, um, you know, th this should really be, you know, one of the first things that we should be addressing um, given what happened uh, July 5th and given what's happened, because it's not just July 5th, right? Prior to July 5th, we had had town, um, you know, when CSWG was doing the work, we had done all these like town forums and, and a gazillion people, well, I'm not gonna say gazillion, but a lot of people talked about their interactions with the police and, and especially BIPOC people and how they've had negative interactions. And then the seventh generation report documented, right? All of the different negative interactions that, that BIPOC people have had. Um, with APD. And so um, we can't wait, you know, again, in terms of building trust, um, you know, and transparency, this work needs to be um, started, you know, now you can't wait for the resident oversight board to happen. Um, the police can't continue to interact, especially given what happened July 5th, the way that they did, and continue to interact like that until a resident oversight board is put in place. The review needs to begin you know, now, again, tap the groups that you have in place, like CSSGC and others, to kind of, if you don't know how to do it, then then tap us, right, so that we can help you to know how to do it, because you can't wait, you know, any longer for this to happen, and really kind of map out how you respond to incidents, too, because as we saw, you know, the response to the July 5th incident was, you know, this is my opinion, was, 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 problematic, you know, at, at least and terrible at best, you know? So, um, so you know, we, we need to look at these things. It cannot wait. Um, and the fact that, that, you know, that that's happening is, is really troubling to me. I, I'm really, you know, frightened by, by, by this fact that it, there's just this little holding thing saying that we're gonna wait for resident oversight board to be in place. I mean, you know, for me, it's really a slap in the face um, to the community and those that have suffered at the hands of, of APD. Thank you, Deb. Before we go to Ms. Pat, I just wanted to look to Paul or Pamela to see if, if they had any response to that. I'm eager to hear what Ms. Pat has to add. Absolutely. Sure. So I'm coming from business perspective. When I read that particular 
safety protocol. I'm like, our town doesn't have safe, safety protocol. I don't know what to make of that, except to say this is another tactics, delay tactics. It's the only thing I can think of and a way to avoid accountability of MS police officers' misconduct. This is one of the ways. Let's wait until resident oversight board, then we create this. Honestly, it's about trust. I don't believe that, you know, APD doesn't have safety protocol. And if they don't, I think BIPOC community should be very scared because it means that police officers will just do whatever they want. And that's what they've been doing. What else can I say? I'm disappointed that our town doesn't have a safety pro protocol. Paul or Pamela? So the reason we put it into the resident oversight board is because we were going to bring in, in a consultant who was going to look at the entire operations of how we were going to implement the resident oversight board. And that included some of the review of these policies that were identified. Um, and I think we thought that was the best way to make sure that it had the complete evaluation that had to include the review of the police department's policies. Um, I know that's not as fast as everybody would like, um, but again, as I was, have been saying throughout, when we make changes, we want to make sure that they stick and that they're, they're, they last for long periods of time. That's why we've been very methodical about every, every step that we have taken. I believe that this approach will be the way that we're able to institute new protocols that, are, that will meet the approval of the town and also be able to be implemented at the police department. Thank you, Paul. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Deb and then um, come back to Councilor Balmilne and Councilor Rooney and Councilor Tov. So um, I just have a follow-up for the town manager for Paul. Um, so what, what do we do in the meantime though, right? Because, you know, I, I, I'm assuming, right? That APD does have a pub, you know, public safety protocols, but whatever protocols they had in place did not work. Right and have hasn't been working for a, uh, a a number of our residents and that those residents are BIPOC residents and residents of a of a, a, a low income uh, um, you know status right a lower lower class status don't get the same treatment don't get treated you know the way that they should with respect and dignity um, and so what happens in the meantime though right. Because we can't have another July 5th incident happen again, yet again, right? And we're seeing uh, uh, how treatment of uh, BIPOC people and Black people in specific are happening on the national uh, um, stage, right? When things aren't changed, it happens again and it continues to happen. So my question to you as a BIPOC person is, what am I supposed to do in the meantime, right? Just wait. For, for, for resident oversight boards to be put in place. One, we, you know, we still need to look at that RFP. I don't even, I don't even know if we're even gonna be happy with what the RFP has to say. So I don't even know what kind of board you all are gonna put together and, and, and you know, whether it's even gonna be something that I'm gonna be okay with. And then you're telling me that that board is the one that's going to review the, the, the safety protocols. What am I supposed to do up until that point? What's the plan up until that point? you know, town in terms of, and, and also the response to the incident was, like I said, terrible. So what's the changes? So, you know, you can't just wait and think that nothing's gonna happen between now and the resident oversight board. What's the plan? I guess I wanna know what's the plan from now until the resident oversight board is in place. Existing policies are, are what they are today. And I know that's not, not that does not meet what the expectations are. Um, but until we can make a change that's going to meet the approval of the, you know, the, this, the resident oversight board with the consultant's help will help develop these pro new protocols. You know, I don't have a whole lot else to add than what I've already reported. 
Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you, Deb. I see Philip's hand is raised. Yeah, I think that Deb is bringing up a good point, Paul, and I know that policies are what policies are. Policies for sure need to be reviewed in this town. And as far as um, the, our report goes in response to it is cross-cultural policy should definitely be looked at because I feel like, as we know, black and brown people are policed different than white people. And in that matter, a policy and a practice may not go hand in hand. And I'll bring up again um, at my work, it happened not too long ago, maybe three weeks ago to where the alarm went off. Three individuals were at the front, my colleagues. I myself am a person of color. There was another person of color and there was a white person of color or a white person. And we went and said what happened. Both people of color were ID'd and the white person was not ID'd at all. We have brought this attention to the police chief and he has said, there's no way that could have happened. So belittling what has actually happened in, I was there, I, I, I lived it. So how did it not happen? So the policy is, as he states, everybody will be ID'd. The practice, two people were ID'd, that were people of color. The person that was white was not ID'd. So policy and practice needs to be addressed in a way that does not affect marginalized communities. And in my every interaction that I've had with Crest um, at the Amber Survival Center, I've never been asked for an ID. So we need to really look at our policies in a way that does not keep marginalizing communities that have suffered at the hands of police that keep on happening, that again, can avoid incidents where racism at a higher level can be stopped. Okay. May, may I respond to that? Absolutely. That, that's, a, that's a really important distinction, which I appreciate uh, um, that direct experience uh, where you differentiate between policy and practice. And the practice is also what we have to be addressing at the same at this time now. And so I, I hear that and I will double check on that one for you, Philip. Can I just say that Cellini and Jennifer have had their hand up for a long time. And can somebody please call on them? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, we're we're just I'm gonna go to Miss Pat and and Deb, and then I'm gonna come back to counselors. Um and I Philip just want to appreciate your willingness to share your personal experience. I think that is really helpful for us um, to better understand. So thank you. So Ms. Pat and then Deb, and then uh, we'll go to Councilor Baumilne and Rooney and Tob. So Councilor Michelle, I just want to thank you the way you're running this meeting, recognizing BIPOC people in this meeting. To, to go first, so I appreciate you. It makes a huge difference. This is the first time I've ever felt being recognized to speak first. So thank you for that. So I have a question for our town manager. So with this uh, safety protocol that is going to be looked at, revised, updated, is there, any provision to when these protocols are violated, you know, what would be the remedies for the victims? And specifically, what is the plan for the, for the MS6 and their families? What is the plan so that the public knows? When are they going to get whole? Thank you. So if you're specifically talking about compensation to the Amherst Six, I think that's what if I'm yes. reading what, yes. Uh, so the town can't issue checks to people. The, the best path forward for the Amherst Six is to, through a, is unfortunately through litigation. 
that a court may order the town to re to re to com compensate people. And that's and you also mentioned insurance. A lawsuit is where insurance gets triggered, and I don't really want to encourage a lawsuit, but I think that you should know that that is your right, and that the, those are the family's rights to file a lawsuit against the town, and that changes everything. That's when the insurance company gets gets triggered. It's also when a court orders the town to do something. I can't order the town to issue a check. That's not within my ability, not within my power. It's not within any municipal official's power to do that. Except that I'm a businesswoman and I'm aware of litigation process, insurance, how they work. Companies can also, leadership can also negotiate to save, you know, tax taxpayers yeah. money. They can negotiate if complainant bring forth litigation. So I know how it works, but none, I have not gotten the outreach and respect that I expected to get this going. So I, I, would I know the options already. Okay. okay. And I, I've been talking to the families to like, is there other way to do this? Since when you know the community is working towards peace, quote unquote, unity and peace. When things go to litigation, that's that's never going to be unity in our town. I can guarantee you that. Go ahead. So, so the town, you know, again, a company is different than a municipal government. So I can't on my own send a check to someone in a situation like this. It has to be through a litigation measure. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you, Ms. Pat. Uh, Deb? Well, thank you. And I want to thank, um, like, like Ms. Pat said, I want to thank Michelle and um, the town council, obviously, for putting this process together where we from CS, uh, SJC and um, HRC um, get recognized first because all the other town council meetings, we were always recognized last. So I'm really appreciating this. And that after we speak, then the, the town council speak, I, I'm, I'm really, you know, thankful that you all are using this process. Um, but really quickly, one, you know, in terms of what Phil said, and I know Phil that that was really difficult for you to, to share, you know, a story like that. But I mean, again, um, and I have to say this to you, Paul, I mean, like I said, and you, I think at some of those town meetings, I mean, there's been countless stories like that. So for you to just say, well, okay, you know, thank you for making that difference between po policy and practice. I mean, again, it, it just, I'm, I'm trying to really focus on trust here. And, um, and it doesn't, you know, you know, kind of creating me some confidence in the town, right? To say that, okay, all the other countless stories and what happened to the youth on July 5th is gonna be taken into consideration because now yet again, another story and now you acknowledge, okay, yes, thank you, Phil, you know, uh, Philip. So, uh, you know, I just want you all, the town to, th to think about all of the stories, right? And all of the people that are being impacted on a daily basis and what are we going to do and that's why we said things need to happen now and then second Paul the the, the response that you had to Miss Pat about the Amherst um, youth and their families being made whole and now you said you know for them to just go to litigation I mean again I'm very saddened and disappointed by that response because I'm like so as we stated it beforehand so you're not even willing to engage with Miss Pat as the representative of the family, I would just say like before making a response like that, well, y'all should just go to litigation. Why don't you say, I'm gonna engage with Ms. Pat, who's the representative of the, of the family to see if there's anything that we could do. Short of maybe, yeah, you can't write a check, but I bet you there's a gazillion other things that you could do to help heal the, the, the situation. So I, I'm really, you know, really like, <laughs> I, don't, I just don't know, I'm at a loss for words at this point that, that's the response to Ms. Pat is, y'all just go to lit litigation. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what? Come on, hey, you're the town manager. It, you know, I mean, have you had a conversation? I guess this is a question. Have you had a conversation with Ms. Pat as a representative of the families to ask, 
What do these families want? Let me, let me ask just that question. Have you? I have not had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Ms. Pat. I have had a conversation with a parent um, of one of the, of the uh, um, young people, um, but I have read what Ms. Pat has written and it has focused on compensation. So that was my answer. The, the question I clarified was, was this about compensation? I'm happy to have a conversation with Ms. Pat at any time. And I offer that to you, Ms. Pat, and we can set up a time, you know, tomorrow to when you would like to meet, I would actually uh, would welcome that very much so. Thank you. <clears throat> you, Ms. Pat and Paul and Deb. Okay, um, Councillor Balmilm. Paul, I understand that um, you just explained why you'd like to wait for the residence oversight board to be created before we go into um, and to do this thoughtfully and but has there been any effort to look at the leap report so far and um that was it was done by professionals and has anyone even has anyone looked at it to see if there's anything that we can start implementing right away and also especially with respect to minors because what i'm hearing is or at least that's the part that's clear to me is that there was um there's a discrepancy between what we are hearing um from the police chief from his side what he was doing was protecting the kids because they were minors and not letting them go home they wanted the families to come and pick them up and that was a, an act of concern and that was perceived as being held back by the kids um so i think there's these uh, potential things that can be resolved and we don't have to wait for so just that yeah so i can i will revisit that and uh, review that again i have not looked at through that lens exactly for the for the, the youth and so i can do that uh council rooney Thank you. It occurred to me that that perhaps in the in the interim between having a, a resident oversight board in place, I wonder if it did not put press in an awkward position of of reviewing someone else's policies. Would it not be something that press could at least start reviewing from the lens of how do we interface with people with all of their training, with all of their engagement knowledge? Can they start to go through the policies and, and, and safety protocols um, with specifically with that lens that they are now that they're now using? And you know, start underlining and highlighting the things that can be brought to the attention of the police department at this time, um, it seems to me that that would be even a probable first step to address item number four, which is again to develop protocols for the press department itself. Maybe there, maybe there's some um, uh, energy gained in or time saved even uh, in starting to look at both of these together. Thank you. I, I think maybe I can answer at least part of that, uh, which is we we certainly are engaged with the PD around our policy development. And I think kind of naturally in that process, there's certainly conversation back and forth about uh, the way that those processes might intersect, the way that we might have shared training and shared language and shared understanding. Um, I do just want to say I'm I'm not a cop. I don't, I don't think I'm going to be a cop at any point. Um, and so there is some language in that world that I do think it makes more sense for folks like like Leap to talk about, because that, that's a group of retired law enforcement. Um, but certainly, um, you know, my commitment to participate in any conversation I'm involved in continues um, and, and glad to help out. You know, I'm, I'm proud to be on the team here, glad to help out any way I can. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Councillor Tom. Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of the third, just trying to throw out an idea. Um, you know, so that we can move um, 
revising the safety protocols you know, sooner than, than maybe the year it would take for the resident oversight board to be seated. So I don't know if this is possible since the RFP has already been, um, you know, released with the scope of services, but could, you know, whoever the consultant is that's retained through that um, while they are, you know, working on, um, you know, putting together the uh, criteria or whatever, helping to select the resident oversight board, could they also be working with the CSSJC and the Human Rights Commission, CRESS, I mean, whoever would be the the groups to work with, um, the representatives from the community and the town to start to put protocols together so that can be happening at the same time that they're putting together the resident oversight board. So those protocols are in place as sooner rather than later. That, just throwing that out as a suggestion. Um, so can I, I'll just say that I, although the RFP does state that it's um, in phases one and two, and it seems that it is sequential, I think that there are going to be some of those phases that do overlap. And it does envision that the consultant would work with uh, the town manager and other town departments and um, boards around uh, those policies and forms. So I think some things will be happening um, at, you know, at the same time, simultaneously, not necessarily as it's um, sequentially as it's written. So I think the answer to that is yes. Thanks, Pamela. Uh, Councillor DeAngelis. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm assuming, and I can be wrong, that the the protocols, the safety protocols that the police department uses should be public documents. Is that correct? And is there any way that they can be forwarded to members of the CSSJC and also to council members so we can begin to look at them as well? Sure, that can be done. They're on the, uh, they're on the police department's website, but we can share them with you proactively. Thank you, Miss um, Pat. So this is kind of related. So um, there are a bunch of kids in town who, you know, call me Auntie or Mom as a way of respect. So I was um, spending time with a family recently, and a young kid in one of the elementary school building had mentioned something about the police officer being in their building. So if we're thinking about safety protocol, we also need to think about kids, youth, because they see you know, what police officers do to people who look like them. I don't think police officers should be in any school building. It can be traumatizing for black and brown kids. As much as it's trying to do community policing, police officers do not belong to our schools, especially for our kids of color, because it's the same blue uniform that harass their uncles, their father, their brother, their parents, their aunts, and so on and so forth. So I hope that will be a language in terms of safety protocol. Police officers should not be in our school uh, buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, before we move on to number four, I just wanted to bring the attention to the LEAP report in case folks who are listening may, may not be aware of it. Um, this is a group that the CSWG worked with um, and they gave recommendations on protocols. That report is available in the CSSJC's report as a link, um, and it's also available on the CSWG's homepage, um, the Town of Amherst's uh, CSWG homepage. Um, and I do see Councillor Walker has her hand up, so I'm going to go to Councillor Walker, and then um, I also see that Earl has his hand up. Um, I just had a quick question while we were talking about police protocol. I was reminded that we also 
passed a motion that we were going to be um, the town manager was going to be working with the police department to create a proactively anti-racist department and wondering what steps or changes have been made to the PD or their policies because that was part of that looking at the policies and what changes could be made to move towards being proactively anti-racist and I'm wondering if there hasn't been any start to that. Caller Pamela? Yeah, so we have gotten started by uh, not in a policy review, but with having um, workshops with the police department um, through conversations with the, the chief, we've committed, we meaning the offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion have committed to uh, three workshop opportunities with all three shifts. The first one occurred, um, I think probably at the end of March and uh, will be due back to go to them um, on their next professional development day. So um, we felt that there was you know, a lot of information to cover. Obviously you can't cover all of the conversation that you have to, to have around becoming anti-racist in one workshop. So uh, looking at what we thought was a minimum, decided that three opportunities to visit the police department was warranted. And the first one has occurred, and there are two others that will be scheduled. Alicia, yes, please. Councilor Walker. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Pamela, for that clarification. I just also wanted to stress, or I guess question, a question first, that if there will be other steps taken after the conversations because part of me like I'm understanding in that like there needs to be some sort of conversation and understanding towards building knowledge around what anti-racism is um, but training doesn't create anti-racism and so like things need to be put in place policies need to be changed to create the anti-racist environment like just giving a training on what it is doesn't actually do that and so I'm wondering like what are the steps after the training that's more of what I was looking for like what changes to their day-to-day -day routines to their day-to-day -day policies that are going to reflect these trainings all right so I think um uh your point is well taken but anything that would require a change in work conditions for the police officers has to go through the collective bargaining process so, and as you heard, um, or you may have heard earlier, uh, the uh, town, um, town legal counsel and the HR director are in the process of doing collective bargaining. Um, but, and so from the DEI office perspective, we're beginning to have the conversations in the workshops and um, obviously have been in contact with the HR di uh, director about uh, some of these issues, it'll be the HR director and legal counsel and town manager who will have to um, do engage in the collective bargaining piece that will lead to changes in work conditions. But you know, unfortunately, that's that's the only answer I have at this point. Thank you, Pamela and um, Alicia. Um, I I see your hand is still up. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. That is helpful to understand. Um, my only concern is that I think, and I, I could be wrong about this, but I think the bargaining process has been happening for quite a while at this point, um, because I think this is the same exact answer that we got last year at this time, that they were in the collective bargaining process. And so it's taking quite a long time. And so one, I'm assuming, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that we can't, like we wouldn't be able to implement any of these changes during this bargaining process and so that we would have to wait for the next bargaining process if there were things that we wanted to effectively change and so why would we not be looking into what those things could be or are now okay. so um the collective bargaining process is always long and cumbersome um and uh, parties either parties either management or the union would have the uh ability to do impact bargaining so in theory there are you could um, seek something for the police department and impact bargain for that thing currently. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms uh, uh, rather than in specifics because I'm not a part of the process and I don't know what the conversations have been. But they're, in theory, I would say you're not precluded um, from, uh, 
from having a change if you could, you know, if you went through the impact bargaining process. And uh, Paul is probably the best uh, in the best position to say more about that. Yeah, so we are in the middle of negotiation, so I really can't comment very much, but it is for the current contract that would, once it's agreed to, would go into effect immediately. So it's not for a successor agreement, it's for an agreement that would, as soon as we get to a conclusion, that becomes the new contract, effective as soon as it's signed by both parties. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Deb. Yeah, I guess this is a, a follow-up question for, for Pamela and for Paul uh, in terms of, you know, I think uh, Councillor Alicia uh, Walker made a great question here, which is, you know, how can, how can um, you work with the police to be actively anti-racist? And I don't think that you need to wait for union process for the police department to be actively anti-racist. Um, you can do a variety of different things that can happen to, in terms of messaging and in terms of how the police are going to interact with, you know, those outside of, well, within the police department and outside of the police department to make sure that they are actively anti-racist. I don't see how any of that has to be bargained as part of the union. Now, if you're asking them to do extra work, extra hours, extra this, extra that, Yes, that has to go through the union process. Now, changing the police department to be actively anti-racist and changing the way that the police department acts from within and without and messaging and making sure that they are actually behaving in an anti-racist way and, and starting to understand those things, that doesn't have to be, that does not have to be bargained. So I, I have a question about that. Why does that have to be bargained? I'm confused. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right, Deb. Um, it, uh, that kind of activity that uh, Pamela and Jennifer are doing is being done. It doesn't have to be bargained. The, the sort of education, the engagement with the officers, when they do it, they go down three times to make sure they, collect, to, they cover all three shifts because you know they, they all work different shifts or some people work midnight, some people work four to midnight, et cetera. So they go down and meet with the different shifts so they can do this training. That is that is part of the effort, and Pamela can speak much more persuasively or clearly about that way of you know how do you change an organization, the people in an organization? It's not a, you know as she said it's not one workshop. It's a, it's a, um, a continued level of engagement, and I think Pamela, I, I've admired how she has started to engage all town. Um, um, uh, employees. It isn't just police. It's also DPW. It's a town hall. It's a library. She has been, she and Jennifer have done a, done a really terrific job at um, rolling out different things, uh, ways for the community, for the town employees to be engaged. And she's welcome to speak more on that if she wants, but it, it's, you know, she understands that it's just not a one and done type thing. It's a, it's a continuous in, um, involvement of our of our staff and learning and learning and sharing. Pamela, no, is I anything? Mean, I, I get that. Wait, before Pamela like responds, I mean, but I think it has to be an and both, right? Because like a, a, a like counselor Alicia Walker was talking about, can't just be the education. It has to be a partnership between DEI and also, um, so I'm just gonna focus on the police. I know obviously I'm, I'm glad that all the other town members are also getting it because everyone needs to, but focus on the police right now. It has to be work with the police chief, with all of his deputies, with all of the supervisors, the lieutenants, all of the sergeants, so on and so forth. It comes from, from the leadership, right? So the leadership, it can't be just the education from you know, Pamela's uh, group, right? It has to be Pamela's group along with the police chief and the leadership at the police. So is that happening? Is, is it happening where the messaging is coming from the top, right? So is the police chief, you know, can you send us, right, copies of the police chief sending messages to their person, his personnel stating that poli the police department is anti-racist? So I, I, I can't speak to that because I'm not the police chief, but I can tell you that um, the workshops that 
the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is doing for the police department and every department in town is customized to the work of that department. And in each of those uh, instances, I've met with the head of the department, I've talked about the content of the workshop, and we've talked about the best way uh, to deliver that. So um, I, I spoke with Chief Slimmingston, I also spoke with Gabe Ting. We talked about what the content should be, we talked about the delivery method and how we could, could engage the officers in the content, and that's ongoing. The same process has been used for DPW, the same process is being used for the fire department and every other department, talking about where each department is, what their needs are, how can we customize the conversation to the work of that department. So I, I believe that the answer is yes, that we are doing um, both and. The and part of, of some of the work is being uh, handled by uh, uh, the town manager, uh, the HR director and legal counsel. Um, and the and part of the, part of the question is um, being handled by the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. So Paul, do you have any information in terms of the messaging from the leadership? At, in the police department? I, I don't know what the chief has written to his staff. I just know that he has been, he and their leadership team have been working very closely with Pamela, as have the other department heads. So it's not unique to the police department. We as a as a department head, as a leadership team, are committed to this. And I, you know, we are blessed to have the leadership of Pamela, who has knows how to do this work. I trust her judgment on how to implement these things, um, this type of training and education and engagement with our employees. It's so I, I feel like we're on a really good path. And I hope that people would, you know, trust that we're moving this in a positive way. Well, I guess my last point would just be to, you know, to build, to continue to build that trust and it would be transparency, right? To share that with the community. To, for us to know what the police chief is actually sharing to the, his leadership and the rest of, of the police department in terms of actively building an anti-racist department, right? Which is, which is obviously going to leave, you know, some of the vestiges for whoever the new police chief is going to be, right? So, so I, I think, you know, if this is, is indeed happening, which I didn't know about until we, we now ask these questions, we need to know more about it, right? And it needs to be in other languages. It needs to be shared in different modalities so that a community is understanding what's the work that's being taken place. Thank you, Deb. Um, so, uh, Councillor Walker, I know this was your question initially. I do see Ms. Pat's hand is raised, um, and it may also be in relation to this. Um, so I'm going to ask Ms. Pat if she'd like to add to this, and then we'll come back to you, Councillor Walker, and then to Councillor Pam. So actually, I have a positive uh, comment to actually make since we're talking about anti-race uh, racism. And I think one of the ways also is to reach out to people that are hard to reach. And I want to illustrate an incident in March where our town manager, uh, the Crest Director and Jennifer Moisten, they came to Black Business Association of Amherst. Needless to say that not only that the meeting was productive, but as a, you know, I'm, I'm a member of that group. It was a big deal for some of our town residents to meet our town manager for the first time. Some of them don't know who he is. Same thing with our new press director. When we're talking about outreach, breaking down barriers, the way it should go is to have the people in power go into the community and meet those people at their own terms. Don't ask us to come to your office, come to us. What a difference it made. 
And I was hoping that the town manager will brag about that and put it in his report, but he did it. But I think we appreciate three of you that were there. I also want to comment on some town councillors who have reached out when I raised the concern about inequity, uh, inequity in upper funds. I've been saying this for more than nine months now. And the upper funds were supposed to help anyone in a, uh, that has been impacted negatively by, by pandemic. I raised this issue. Everybody knows that it has been in the media. The town council leadership didn't bother to bring it up. All the existing black owned businesses in our town did not receive a dime. Out of the $650,000 that was earmarked for businesses. But I wanna thank Councillor Dorothy PM and Jennifer Tom for their private support, reaching out to me privately. I appreciate two of you. I also wanna appreciate Councillor Michelle Miller, who on behalf of, his, uh, of her group, ARHA, they may be attending the next BBA meeting for listening session. No outreach from the council president and the council vice president, the, the town council leadership. Even though we live in this town, we pay our taxes, we go to vote, and yet when it comes to resources, we do not get it. And when we speak up, we have power, powerful people disparaging members of BBA. We have business improvement district, despite a director, gold, disparaging two well-respected well restaurant owner in our town. So if we're talking about anti-racism or working on racism, there has to be strategic collaboration and engagement in our own terms, many people of color, we need to lead. You need to come to us. We need to tell you what we need. We need to work together. You can't say, my door is open, come to me. We've been oppressed already. Do you guys understand how difficult it is to even speak at meetings like this as a person of color, no matter your age? But I just wanna thank the town manager for taking the courage to come. And I hope it was you know, meaningful to you. Thank you. And yeah, we haven't received any money. We're a legitimate group, okay? We are 51C whatever, nonprofit, just like that, but we didn't get any money, nothing, zip. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Uh, Councillor Walker and and then Councillor Pam. Um, thank you. I'm going back to a previous topic, but I did just really quickly want to emphasize and support um, Ms. Pat's concerns specifically regarding ARPA spending, um, spending. And I think that that would be a great conversation to have for another time in terms of equitable spending of the ARPA funds. Um, but I also just wanted to come back to the um, creating the anti-racist department of, at the PD um, and talking about that this was a recommendation that came up in terms of like something that could be implemented immediately um, to restore trust and to create safety for our BIPOC residents who will still have to deal with the PD because no matter what, even when Crest is taking 911 calls, the police will still need to respond to some calls and they will still be responding and dealing with BIPOC residents. And so this is like immensely important. And I think that's getting very lost in translation here that like we're talking about the safety of black and brown people at the hands of the police. Like this is very serious. Um, so that's one and that like 
I'm not talking about training. And I don't know how much I have to emphasize that because I've said that before. And I said that when I proposed the motion itself, but like training doesn't actually change anything that doesn't change the way the police are dealing with the public. It doesn't change what the policies are. It doesn't change what their protocols are. It doesn't change how they talk to each other. It doesn't change how they talk to people in the community. It doesn't change anything. Like I'm talking about real tangible changes that we can measure, that we can present, not just, hey, we had a conversation about this, and now they're just doing what, the same thing they were doing before, but they had a conversation about it first internally. Like, that is not what I'm talking about when I'm saying creating an anti-racist department. I, I think it's great they're having conversations. I think everyone should continue to have these conversations, but that is not what I meant when I proposed this motion, and I thought I made that very clear, that that was not what I was expecting. Thank you. Um, Dorothy, you are up. I just want to let everyone here know that if you need to take a recess for any any reason, you can always turn your camera off. You can also call a point of order and ask for a recess. So just in case folks weren't aware of that, I wanted to make sure everyone knew. Uh, Dorothy. Okay. I have a, a question and a comment. Um, how long is this new police contract? Is it one year or is it three year? So typically contracts are three years. So I mean, to me, I'm sitting here in my spare time sometimes saying, what am I going to do on the weekends? To me, the summer's here. And I can see it's a, it's a long cycle and there's a lot of legal things and a lot of law, but they're going to be a contract and it will not have the new whatever things in it. Okay. So that's a, that's a real delay. So I, I just want to say a positive and then a suggestion. Um, you have acted with incredible speed um, with people who work for you in setting up press. I mean, amazing. Okay. And it's, it's kudos, not just to you, but to the whole town of Amherst and it's known nationally and setting up the, the DEI department. Um, but I, I think that you have been dragging your feet when it comes to people who don't work for you. And I mean, I understand that um, because you can't always tell what they're going to do. And sometimes they say things that you don't like, or you don't agree with, or you don't even think are true. Okay. But I, I just want to say, I really do have a lot of trust in you. And I think I've shown that and I've said that. So I'm just, one of the themes that I think we're coming up with here is, is for you to have a little more trust of some of the other people in town. And, and I think that we can, because I think we all agreed, we want to move on these things. We want to make some changes. We want a safer town. We don't all agree on things. Um, for example, I don't totally agree with Ms. Pat about no police in the school, because if there's a, a shooter or something dangerous, I want our police department to go in there fast and not be like, oh, well, Texas, okay? So I, I do, and I really do see the need for a strong police department. But I think that what the kind of restructuring of public safety that's going on here is really good. And, I, and I'm really happy with it. But I, I just think we need to trust each other a little bit more and it'll be it, it'll be mutual is how, what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm an optimist. But I think it'll be a mutual increase in trust. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, Shalini. Um, I just want to do clarify a point that was made about uh, no ARPA funds being awarded to Black businesses because we did receive a detailed list of businesses uh, that were awarded. And out of that, just to give a few examples, m and Links, Head Games, Global Guts, Carefree, Cakery, and White Lion were given uh, awarded the funds and from, um, and then 97% of the grants went to BIPOC, LGBTQ, and women-owned businesses. And that being said, um, you know, no process is perfect. And I feel that if, uh, you know, if people, uh, if Ms. Ananabaku has noticed that there's some ways that this process could be improved, I would really encourage um, sitting down with uh, with the committee, there's a committee, it's not the bid, that's my understanding is there's a committee that's uh, made up of diverse people who 
uh, then go through all the applications and then award. But if that process can be improved, which I'm sure any process can, uh, that that feedback should, I mean, I think I would be happy to sit in that meeting and find ways to improve that process. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Um, Ms. Pat. May I respond? Actually, um, it's incorrect. And this is the narrative that the bed has been spreading in the media. It's not true. None of existing Black-owned businesses, regardless whether they're members of BBA or not, did not receive a dime. In fact, that document I requested and the uh, finance director sent it to me. Existing businesses, none of black business got that. I'm not talking about new businesses that are going to be opening up, that are renting from big landlords. I'm not talking about that. Existing business category, black owned businesses, document online. I have them. And I, I requested that it be included in the packet for CSSJC meeting tonight so the public can see. When I open my mouth to say anything, I do my research. And I'm very confident when I open my mouth because that's why people trust me. I beg to disagree with Shalani because it's not true. The so-called 90 something percent of marginalized all, it's all in incorrect because the way it was put, white women were considered minority. Again, I don't have any problem of any business owner who received funding, but to put white women as minority or marginalized to make up the percentage is very um, deceiving to the public. So the records are there. They should be on the town website, go to CSSJC and look at it and the public can make their judgment who is telling the truth tonight. Because I know what I'm talking about. Again, existing business category, no black owned business receive funding. However, new businesses like Kekri received and is a member of BBA. She's going to be opening up in June, okay? Global Court never received a dime. And I'm going to let him know tomorrow because his business has been mentioned tonight where he did not receive any money for the upper fund. He did not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And um, it sounds like maybe there's some clarification that's needed and, and maybe Paul and Sean um, will be able to provide that clarification and, and make that available to, to everyone. That would be great. Um, yes, Councillor Lopes. Uh, yeah, so first I just you know want to thank everyone for participating in this meeting, the CSSJC and the HRC, and in particular to Elizabeth Hagen for calling out, uh, calling attention to the importance of hearing the youth perspective um, directly from youth voices and particularly in spaces uh, that uh, decision-making spaces rather um, where they haven't been included as possible. Uh, but I do think that if we have a discussion and we're talking about the bid, we have discrepancy of information. Um, the bid has shown clear facts um, that not just the second round, but the first round, that there was money awarded to Black businesses, to BIPOC businesses. And this conversation, if we're, you know, as if we're talking about businesses, I believe those business owners should be there, um, as well as Gabrielle Gould. Um, and whoever else is, is having that so we can move forward because we are dealing with something where at the end of the day, if we're talking with state funding, with state regulations, there is a process to how that money could re be received and who. So to put it in a situation where it's about public opinion and who believes who, when it's something that and we have all of these A's and B's and Amherst and having to do that, this is a situation where we can use facts, where you know we can know what businesses received, why, and why not. 
And I think if not, you know, we're, we're being divisive because, you know, at the end of the day, the bid was the only organization throughout the pandemic that was out there and doing something, calling attention to business. There were not other organizations were not out there publicly. And last, I think we want to be careful because if we're not all coming together around this issue, we're going to be sending a message to youth that if you simply receive an I, um, you know, an LLC or register as a business, then that's going to come with a virtual assistant or someone who will connect you to what funding or whatnot is available for you. When in actuality, as we all know, you may need to hire somebody to do that, or you have to introduce yourselves as a new business so you can receive and be directed to that funding. So I think that if we are to carry this situation, we should really have all the stakeholders involved as we're talking about everything else, we're bringing those stakeholders, because if not, this is slander and this is hearsay. And you know we're just risking the public coming to a conclusion when they, they don't have to, or they could at least include clear facts in making that decision. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Um, I just, uh, Ms. Pat, before I go to you, just want to confer with um, the chairs of the committees. Um, so the chair of the town council and the chair of the two committees um, in terms of timing. Um, so we have number four, five, six, and seven to continue through. Is everyone um, good to, to keep moving ahead on, on these items? I'm just looking. It, I, I mean, how how much more time is there going to be? Because I do have <laughs> my child at home and so on and so forth. So, what what is this looking like? Yeah, I I, I think that I respect and know that this conversation is definitely needs to be had. I do think that for the sake of everybody's time, we may need to set aside a different meeting to have this conversation and have this go on. So I I at least as far as for HRC and if any member thinks otherwise, I think moving forward would make sense. Yeah, could we get another date on the books? I would suggest that we go through the other three items and if there are other items that are also important to various members of the group that that be uh, collected and we look at what the appropriate venue is for the discussion of those other items and if additional data needs to be available for those. But we did set an agenda that was based on these seven I items and I would prefer for us to finish those seven items and then look for other opportunities and other means to have the discussion about other issues. Thank you. But um, Lynn, uh, respectfully, there's four more items that we need to talk about. I don't want to be rushed, Thank but I'll you. stay. I will stay on and I will talk then. And we'll be Thanks. here until midnight. So that's fine. I, 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 but I'm, I'm not going to be rushed. If you all want to continue, fine. But we will talk through all of them ad nauseum. Well, here's a suggestion. So I think in terms of the ARPA, um, this is a really important conversation. And of course, none of it can be disconnected. It's all um, integral to what we're talking about. Um, it's it, it does appear that we need to get some clarifying information and perhaps have some other folks who could join this conversation. So I, as a council, would like to ask the chair of uh, the town council to work um, with Paul to figure out how we might, uh, as you said, Lynn, have a venue for that discussion. Um, with respect to the four items that we have remaining, I think uh, we should continue on and if folks are good with that, maybe do another check in at about 1030 and see where we're at because our, our <laughs> brains will start to uh, deteriorate here. <laughs> um, and I just I would like to before we move on to number four, check in with Miss Pat and Alicia to since their hands are both raised to see if that sounds like a plan we can um, move forward with. Okay, I just want to say to Anika that I stand by everything that I said and the public 
will find out who is telling the truth. Being powerful is not good enough. It is for people to follow the facts. And I'm excited for the public to find out who is telling the truth. Is it me or is it Anika and uh, Shalani or the big director? The public will soon find out. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And Councillor Walker? Um, yeah, thank you, Michelle. I definitely think that it would be very wise to have another time to talk about ARPA funds and ARPA spending. I just really quickly wanted to add that I think part of like the challenges and the complications with ARPA funds is like one transparency. We don't do a very good job of reporting and tracking what is being used and where and the, the sheets that are available on the town website are very confusing because there are a lot of monies that have been al allocated but have not yet been spent. And the way that those are identified on the website are very confusing. Um, and I think there it's also just the way that we chose to distribute the ARPA fund, which were quite strange. Um, and I really highly suggest you all looking at the way that other towns have done it might help provide some clarity, specifically Springfield, which gave millions of dollars to BIPOC owned businesses and nonprofits, very different than the way that Amherst has and very different the way that they tracked it on their town website. And so I think looking at the way other towns have done it in comparison to how Amherst have done it might explain some of the frustration. Um, but I also am happy to have this conversation at another time. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Okay, so with that, let's uh, go ahead and move on to number four, which is continue to develop protocols for CRESS regarding active engagement by community responders. Um, and we'll follow the same process and Deb will uh, get us started. All right, thank you. Um, so for me with Cress, um, and, and Ms. Pat already talked about it, and I didn't know that it was only $20,000 that they were given additionally for this next fiscal year, uh, which again, you know, doesn't make sense to me. Um, and that, you know, the police department is getting, you know, hiring and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, Cress needs to be 24-7. Um, Crest needs to be fully staffed so that uh, the police are not responding to um, um, anything that is nonviolent, um, which was what we had put in the CSWG. Um, and with Crest not being fully funded, not having the staffing, not really having, um, you know, the, um, the wherewithal, because they need capacity, you can't you know, burn people out, like even like Earl, I mean, he's doing an extraordinary job, but he's only one person in terms of the leader, he needs to be an assistant director, there needs to be other kind of, uh, uh, you know, leaders put in place there to help out. Um, and so that's not going to happen with an additional uh, $20,000, right? Because you can't burn people out, you can't, because then it's, it's not sustainable for, for, for them to be able to do the work. But yeah, the community needs for there to be you know, something in place so that the police are not responding to nonviolent um, incidents at, as what occurred in July 5th, right? Um, so wanna know that and also, so how is that, my question is, so how is that gonna happen with the current staffing and with only an additional $20,000? That is my question. Yeah, so what I think what I'd say is there's, about 85 departments similar to what we do in the country. There's probably 20 or 30 that have the scope we have. There's maybe eight that have the, the kind of structural support we do, the independence we do. There's nobody that's a separate department. None of those much larger departments, Denver Star, Cahoots in Oregon, have gone 24-7 yet. Um, it It is a tricky uh, step on two levels. Um, the call volume is much lower. So it frankly, isn't a super attractive position. You're not gonna have much to do at the beginning. Um, and the second piece is, I, I think when we talk about adding a second shift, people think about maybe doubling the staffing. You're actually talking about closer to tripling the staffing to get to a third shift. You have to have, add a whole new leadership component. Um, that leadership team needs to be as comfortable as I am. Um, the one thing I, I am really concerned about 
is us taking steps before there's the kind of capacity. And then, you know, I, I love the people I work with. I love my coworkers. I am fortunate to have my coworkers and I worry about adding a large group of people without a really kind of thoughtful understanding of what the lo work looks like, which we're still developing. I recognize that me telling you that we're the fastest in the country, we still don't feel fast enough for Amherst. And, and I, I lose sleep over that idea, uh, most of anything in my job, that um, I want to get this to where folks need it to be as quickly as I can. Um, as far as the technical pieces of it, it takes folks quite a while to get up to speed on the approach. It's, 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 some of the work we do is counterintuitive to what folks think of as public safety. You're asking folks to go into really challenging situations, and at no point are they going to have an ability to coerce the person. They're not going to have an ability to deny them access to a thing. They're not going to have the ability to take a thing away from them, to fine them, to punish them. Um, so getting people up to speed really, I think, has turned out to be about a nine-month process. So... Um, I, that's just on the technical end of things. I don't think that even if the resources, the exact amount of money to add folks was, we'd still be a year out from me feeling any sort of comfort with, with that overnight shift. Um, and particularly Denver is going overnights this summer. And so I'm watching really closely um, how they're doing it, how they're approaching it, the infrastructure they're building, what looks very different. Um, so on a technical end, I, I just think we're probably, um, I, I often think of Alicia in describing this of, you know, I know I'm holding you guys as baby, the baby's out of the crib, but boy, it ain't running yet. Um, it is, it is toddling along and we're, we're still needing to develop some, some experience. That's the one thing I, I can't hire anybody who's experienced at this. The, the only way to get it is to do the job and to do it for a long enough period. Um, so you know, as far as uh, the budget, that is a decision that, that's been made. Uh, on my end of things, I think we need to earn it. Um, that is my philosophy to, to this, is I think when you think about the kind of original sin of public safety, is that the money has always followed people's fear. People were so afraid of Black folks, they put money into the more violent aspects of policing, whereas we have the opportunity to look at the work to thoughtfully approach it, to ask for resources as we need them. Um, and again, I'm, I think that's an unsatisfying answer. And I, I know that, but I would be doing a disservice to the work to say, what we're doing is art. And, and if you rush art, you, you put people in a bad situation. So sorry Earl, if that, let me, yeah, yeah, let me, sorry let if me, that, was, that was a weird answer. That's what yeah, I got. I have, I have a follow-up um, with that. So, so I guess we have two situations, right? So we have the, the community, right? That is asking, especially the marginalized BIPOC community that is asking for there to be someone else, a, a different group of people, and obviously, ideally, Cress, to respond to these nonviolent matters um, as opposed to the police, right? So we're talking nonviolent, you know, alcohol, drugs, um, any type of resources, anything that that community members are going through, uh, because we know a lot of times when the police respond to that, those things will go awry, as what happened, you know, Exhibit A, July 5th, right? And so, um, so we have that, and then I have you saying, I guess, right? So then I want to be clear then. So you're saying that Crest can't grow, well, not can't grow, that Crest is growing slowly, but surely you need the time, so on and so forth, so you are content then right, with the $20,000, you're content where you're at, and so on and so forth. I guess I, I just want to be clear in terms of what it is, because for yeah. me, my my concern, obviously, I, I'm, I, I love Chris, and you all are doing a phenomenal job, and that's why, right, that's why I want it to be more, you know, and so my thinking is, hey, let me give, let me advocate to give you more so that the community can get what they want, which is no police response to, so that the police don't watch it up. But you're telling me, I think no. <laughs> is, is that what no. you're saying? No, yeah, so at this what I'm, point? What I'm, what I'm telling you is we are moving faster than anyone in this country has ever done with this work. Um, I recognize that that doesn't count the two years of time folks worked on this thing. I don't think there's anything Cress is incapable of. I just don't know that it's ready today. 
Um, I think, you, you know, this is a thing that we're going to have to make a, you're going to have to make a decision as a community. If you're building this thing for a short run, we can do everything really quick. We can get everything running up and there will be big flaws in it. There will be big, big flaws in it. Or we can do this thing where we build it, we get a foundation, we 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 really make sure, like, when we talk about anti-racism, that is a thing that we have to stop at every step and make sure it's still intact. Every time we make a move, we have to stop and make sure that we're not over-serving communities or underserving communities. Have we talked to the community about how they feel about what we're doing? That sort of information gathering takes steps. So uh, by, by no means am I saying that we won't ever get to that point. I think we will get there faster than anybody in the country ever has. That's the pace we've set. Um, but nine, uh, you know, functionally nine, you know, we're, we're eight months into deployment. Um, I, I just there's no there's no evidence from the work around the country that at that point people are experienced enough that you can build a leadership team that can hold those things. I'm I'm not saying that more resources wouldn't be great, but I am saying that there's a difference between building a thing for a short period and building it for the long haul. And the long haul does require these. You know, I, I, again, I just want to say they feel slow and deliberate to us. When I talk to other other municipalities, what they say is, how are you going so fast? Um, there are 10 departments I'm aware of that trained for two years. So so the speed in which we're going, um, there's no there's no precedent for it. And so I, I also, you know, I, I don't. I, I'm afraid that if we we take that big step that I won't be able to assure folks that that my folks will be able to step up when the time is right. And and that's that would be dangerous for them. It would mean the police needing to show up. It would mean them needing to show up uh, in a in a much more fast way, in a way that might lead people to not always be their best selves. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess the answer to your question is, I think we're going as fast as as I can I can make it as I can imagine us going. And we would never turn down resources, but just it, let's say tomorrow my budget got doubled, my job would then turn into a, a fiscal job. I would be spending funding uh, so much that I wouldn't be able to do the on the ground supervision that that the work requires right now. I wouldn't be able to spend the time molding folks into the responders they need to be. And that's, you know, there's nine people, that's nine different people who require real tailoring um, and understanding. So I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry. I, 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 I yeah. know that I'm not, I'm not living up to the highest dreams of folks. I'm just saying that as a human being, I don't know that those highest dreams are attainable where we are right now. So Earl, I mean, and I'm, I'm not about just obviously CSWG, when we made a recommendation for press, we want it to be long-term. We want it to be successful. We want it to have a strong foundation. We want it to have, you know, everything that needed to have for it to be something to go into the future, right? And that's why you have us to keep pressing the town because I understand the town saying, look, we've done all these great things and you all have done a lot of great things, but it's a lot because you have us as pressuring you to make sure that you're doing it. And we're gonna continue with the pressure to make sure that you are doing it, right? <laughs> So, yeah, and, and so, I so want to just me, put a so plug me, in. Me and me and wait, Deb are presenting me, at the Smith School of Social Work conference this summer about this very thing. So this conversation is continuing in lots of different ways. Exactly. Right. So I want it to be deliberate. I want it to be, you know, strong and foundational. So leave, you know, I don't want to, you know, obviously stay the course, right? If that and but I just want a clarity around that. But the other part though is this need from the community, right? So I think though. The town needs to have a plan and again, tap us, CS, SJC and whomever else to figure out a plan for what do we do with the fact that Crest at this point can't respond to all nonviolent. So what are we gonna do? Because obviously with the fact that you all are not looking at safety protocols at, at APD, APD is not an anti-racist department. I'm very afraid in terms of APD continuing to respond to these nonviolent concerns. I appreciate you, Deb. As soon as we can get there, we're going to get there. Michelle, may I interrupt? You. Of course. Yeah, please. Well, I just want to let people know that uh, Pamela is going to have to leave in a few minutes. If there are any specific questions for Pamela, um, we should po pose those now. She has a time limit. Um, uh, so just want to put that on your radar. And if not, that's fine. She will leave when she has to leave. 
So can I just ask everyone who has their hand up to put it down just for a moment? I'm keeping track of the order. Um, and if you have a question specifically for Pamela on any of these topics, um, the ones that we've covered or the ones that we have yet to cover, um, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm gonna go to Deb and then um, Councilor Pam. I guess for me, the only thing that I would have to say for Pamela would be around um, the, cause we talked about some of the other ones, it, just to kind of reiterate around the youth empowerment. Uh, and I'll say this again, I guess, you know, to Paul and everything um, that, you know, in your report, you, you, the town manager is forming a working group to explore youth empowerment and, you know, all these different family outreach center, high school, mi middle school administration, not youth, but administration. Um, and then rec, finance, community participation offices, DEI, CRES, so on and so forth. I didn't hear youth. So for me, I, like I said before, youth need to be front and center in terms of a, creating a youth empowerment um, center. It needs to be their voice. They're the ones that need to be, the working group needs to be them, <laughs> not a bunch of adults that are going to tell the youth what they need. You know what I'm saying? The youth are the ones that should be driving the youth empowerment to say what they need, where it should be located, what's the parameters, and so on and so forth. I learned every day from youth. They are the, the savviest people on this earth, okay? And so, so youth empowerment should be all them. And I'm definitely with Liz when she was saying about having youth in all other stratospheres of the town of town management and, and their input too. But youth empowerment needs to be them. So I hope there's going to be changes to that, to that this whole kind of um, suggestion that you all made for youth empowerment. Because right now, if you all continue down that path, th th that's going to be a mess. And the, and the youth empowerment needs to happen also very quickly. It, CSWG had already put a model in place, so we don't need to start from ground zero. And it seems like over here, it's kind of gathering input, blah, 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 blah. No, that's delay. It's talk to the youth and let's stop putting these things in place. Thanks, Deb. Pamela, would you like to respond to Deb's comments? So I think that the town manager will respond to the first part of the comment about uh, putting together the working group because that is not my, um, that's not my initiative. The, uh, the second part of that discussion deals with the collaboration that press and the DEI department has in place to actually work with youth in the fall. And um, our plan is to share an AmeriCorps member uh, to lead that uh, to lead that work. So it is our plan and our objective to begin uh, working with youth in the fall um, with the help of an AmeriCorps member. So so I, I I'm working on the active programming parts of the of those initiatives. Thank you, Pamela. Um, and it sounds like there's a question for Paul in there, but given your time constraints, Pamela, I'm going to move on and we'll come back to that. Um, and I'm going to go to Ms. Pat, and then I'm going to go to Councillor Pam, Councillor uh, Devlin Gothier, and Councillor Walker. So I just want to remind all of us that CSWG uh, through 7 Jan did their research, they talk to youth of diverse backgrounds that are most impacted by a APD. And one of the recommendations that came up is actually having a youth center. And I know the town council has capital priorities. Where does the youth center fits into all this. When are we going to get a youth empowerment center? And so I know that there is upper funds that were set aside for youth. What happened to that? And the last thing is, why are we doing research again? Seven Gen already talked to youth. It's just delaying too much. That's all I have to say, meanwhile, youth are suffering. I'm very confused about the whole okay. process, honestly. Okay. 
So again, I think that that is a question for the town manager and the, the section of the youth empowerment pro, um, discussion in the report that I wrote really uh, builds upon and looks to the work that was already done uh, and envisions having someone in place to put that into practice. So obviously I don't, you know, I don't have the budget to create a building, a structure for youth empowerment center. I, the goal that I have and that I share with Earl and Press is to have a point person to work with you to do the direct programming activities, initiatives that were envisioned in that report, which mentioned training on legal rights, uh, career development, exposure to colleges, so all of those things are, are things that we hope that the AmeriCorps uh, member um, and have expectations that the AmeriCorps member working with our two departments would do beginning in the fall. I mean, that's all great and I'm not disputing that, but what location in our school building when school building can so traumatize I, I, some of the kids. So right. I get all that. I'm not mm -hmm. questioning the programming, but where I, where where will it happen? So Is there I, a dedicated I, safe space for I, you I do, to do I, this? I have to use existing spaces in, in town or other resources that we might be able to share from community partners, but I don't have a building in place. So my, my best option is to start the programming while other folks are working on creating a building. I can't, I don't wanna wait until the building is in place to start the programming. So I'm trying to start programming now using existing buildings and existing partnerships um, in order to do that because I don't have a building and I can't create one uh, between now and the you know, beginning of the school year but I can start to provide programming in the existing structures that we have. Um, and, you know, I you know, acknowledge your statement that those, the, that those structures may not be ideal, but the reality is that is what I have to work with. So I don't have, I, I can only work with what, with, I can only work with what I have. My last comment, I, I apologize. Um, nothing personally against you, but why is it that anything that benefits BIPOC community, our town council, our town government, our um, finance committee, there is no money, tight budget, you know, it's so tough, but we will have money for other stuff that, that powerful people want in this town. So I don't get it. What message are we sending to our youth? I, I, again, I don't think that that's a question that I am in a position to answer. I understand. The town yeah. Budget. yeah. Yeah. I get it. So um, the youth empowerment is next on our list. So I'm just looking to the counselors that have their hands raised if they have specific questions to Pamela before she has to leave um, on any of the topics. Um, otherwise, we'll come back um, to the youth empowerment shortly. So I'm going to go to Council Pam. Um, so it's very useful uh, what she just said. Um, that number one, she's not putting together the working group, but that um, she is DEI will start the programs while the building, you know, because that 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 is obviously at this moment you know, down the road. So that that is very useful to me. Um, my question is, when are we going to have? I would I really do want to talk about the youth center, and I think that tonight's getting late. Um, I would like to have. I have. I like the ideas that 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 came with C Swag and Seven Gen, but I have some other ideas that I think are very important, which go along with youth and leadership. Um, and some programs I think which would be extremely wonderful for the community. Um, so my simple question to you right now, Pamela, is um, what do you need from us now? So um, 
what I need right now is just um, a little bit of time to start the programming and ideas for programming. And, uh, you know, there are were wonderful ideas for programming in the Community Safety Working Group um, report. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Rhodes also has a wonderful program that I guess he's going to start this uh, summer around entrepreneurship. So I think there's lots of possibilities for programming for youth. I think there's also good opportunities to collaborate with um, Amherst College, Hampshire College, and UMass for additional opportunities. So I am excited about the possibility of having uh, an AmeriCorps member to work with uh, CRESS and DEI to pull those initiatives and programs together. And um, so, you know, I guess um, a little bit of time, right? I, I can't create a building overnight, but I can start the programming and offer it um, in the interim. And that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. So if I have any ideas, I should uh, write them up and then send them to you. Is that it? That, that would be great. Yeah. We'll do that then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. So I'll ask one and then pause for a response if that's okay. And then uh, ask the second. So the first one is regarding the trainings uh, that are the learning opportunities that are being offered. I'm curious if there's a framework or a model that you're utilizing to scaffold those trainings to support the development of an anti-racist culture, both across the town staff, but within departments. To Alicia's point, and as you also recognized, an anti-racist culture isn't developed in training, but mostly partly in the application of what is learned. The training that you listed in your report uh, is wonderful. And especially for white folks, the identity exploration and the context of power and privilege is really an important first step. But I'd love to hear about how you're incorporating that in, into application, into the work intentionally. Um, and I know that if you don't have a model right now to talk about, that's okay. But I'd, I'd love to hear more about that if you don't have it um, top of mind right this moment. Sure. So I mean, I initially reached out to an organization that I'm very familiar with called the National Coalition Building Institute, um, which um, was a wonderful program that I'm actually trained in and went through, I would say now maybe 15 or 16 years ago. But it, it looks like they have um, disbanded or they're not as active in New England as they, as they, as they once were. So what Jennifer and I have been doing is meeting with each department head designing our initial programming for that department. And then our plan is to go back, you know, to scaffold up. So where the, I'll just, you know, use, for example, where the DPW was as far as their initial uh, workshop is not the same as where we envision the fire department, I'll say. And we haven't done the fire department yet. That's coming up in May. The other thing that we're doing with our training is we're going back to each department have to have conversations with them. And this has not started yet. So this is our plan for May and June to have conversations with them about their DEI self-assessment. So each department was asked to do a self-assessment, to look at their um, staffing levels, to look at their the constituencies that they serve, to think about ways in which we can embed um, equity policies and practices into their work. Um, so the goal is to tie, well, to have the initial training and then to go back and tie the future trainings to that equity work. And of course, with each department, I'm sure there are probably dozens of things that we could be tackling, but we're really gonna try to be realistic about this and try to tackle like two to three things in, um, and each uh, each year, because you know, getting into the practice takes time. So if we can identify one or two practices, have people work to achieve the equity, to review their policy on a specific um, practice, and to work towards that, and then go back in year two and repeat the process and expand it. I, I you know, it would. Um, I'd love to say that we're going to change every department. Uh, but we're, you know, overnight or within a short time time frame, but that's just unrealistic, especially given, you know, the fact that we are a department of two and we have um, 
you know, a, a lot of departments both to work with and then repeat the cycle through. So at this, at this point, I mean, I'll, I'll be quite honest to say, I had hoped that we would have done more trainings and more departments as we approach the first year anniversary. Um, I uh, had written into my sort of one year vision um, that we would do a minimum of four and we're gonna make that uh, goal, um, uh, but primarily because we've already done uh, two really large departments. We have a third large department coming up and then we have all of those departments in the Bang Center that we're gonna, which are all sort of, they, they share um, the fact that they're all outwardly facing. So veteran services, senior services, the health department, um, Crest, there is, there is some commonality in how they approach their work with that group. And so we can group them together. But when we start to look at the other departments, you know, finance and accounting and clerk's office, it's going to require, you know, a totally different way of grouping them together, even to bring them together for professional development and, um, and thinking about how we incorporate equity into their work. As you can imagine, you know, um, everyone, uh, no one wants to feel that their work is, um, is inequitable, right? From the perspective of, uh, of members of the town staff, they are doing anti-racist work because they don't think there's or, that there are inequities um, in, in their work. And no one openly says, oh, I'm a racist. The real challenge with having uh, folks have these conversations is getting them to understand how their practices which uh, and policies, which may seem neutral on their face, have a disparate impact on certain communities. And that's not a conversation that you can just have once. Um, it's, it's a conversation that needs to be repeated. And, it, and although um, you need to, to, to start and have the conversation with some mutuality of respect, so I, it is not my approach to go in and condemn and to say, you know, you're doing everything wrong. This is what you should do. It is my approach to talk about uh, the narratives, to talk about the inequities, and to talk about ways in which we uh, can better the work that we do. It just, um, I think the principle that, that explains my approach um, the best is to think about universal design and how it works in the school system. You know, universal design benefits very targeted populations, but it also benefits everyone. And so when you start to have uh, conversations about designs of your programs and policies that are equitable and universal, then you can bring more people along because they don't feel that they're being um, admonished or attacked or uh, denigrated for work which they, you know, probably rightly so, feel that they've been doing the very best that they can. Um, even though that there are, is an opportunity, as someone said, there's always an opportunity for improvement. Thank you. I, uh, I'm i really interested down the road, this, this is not a tonight question, but down the road, I'm really interested in learning if you're about your self-assessment in terms of um, whether you're using competencies that can be measured over time or what areas of focus that you, that you have. And I appreciate you sharing more about that. Uh, my second question is actually about the next point, which is the communications plan. So one of the things that we've talked about today, but um, that I was noting when I was reading is, are there alternate methods within a communication plan that are engaging directly in community to reach the populations that are not being reached by our current modes? The, the existing communication plan talks about putting out, out on all of the typical methods, which is great. Um, and as we've heard tonight, um, it'd be really great to see new modes of providing public access the part that made me uncomfortable about the report was the phrasing of based on expressed need. Because if someone doesn't know how or where or when to express their need, you're not, we're not gonna hear it. And so, or they're not getting the message that we want them to express the need in the first place. So I, I'd really love to hear how you all plan and, and Pamela, I'm, I think this is part you, but maybe it's more Paul actually. Um, I'd really like to hear more about the, uh, 
the process for engaging in community to reach the folks who aren't currently being reached. And I know that's kind of a, a tough scenario because how do you know, right? But we do know in a lot of ways. We've seen other aspects of community outreach. Um, Cress has done a really great job at this. And so I'd like to hear what methods you're using to expand our modes of delivery uh, to reach populations that are not currently being served by, served by our uh, existing practices. So I think that this is an area where um, the town really is in the beginning steps of trying to figure out how best to meet the needs. We know that, uh, that translation services are needed. We're trying to figure out how to have those translation services on demand. We're trying to uh, figure out how to have translation services without um, adding additional burdens or additional responsibilities to current staff who have specific language skills. Um, I've done a little bit of research on this area and looked at some plans that were developed. Um, well, the plans that I looked at were in the, on the federal side. Um, there's also a, a group of DEI directors in the Commonwealth who've been to talking about translations and access. So we're still uh, in the gathering and trying to formulate a concrete plan. Um, I think it will really uh, vary by department, um, how best we can communicate that. And then we have to have some agreement about some basics. Um, and there have been challenges. We, uh, you know, we talked about uh, how to have uh, conversations with the joint meetings where there were translation services available. We, uh, we posted a meeting and I got a request um, about whether we would be able to provide American Sign Language and had to try to scramble to see if I could pull together a list of resources. So there are definitely challenges in this area. I, um, and we're you know, not nearly as far along as I think we would like to be, but I, I will be working with um, Bree and other department heads to address that. And so it is very much a work in progress. I think the benefit is that we do have those earmark funds uh, that can help us pull some pieces together. So um, the research that I've done, I looked up some federal plans that have developed uh, translation and access uh, protocols for various departments that have been very thorough. I've looked at the um, and have conversations with a company that provides um, um, real-time translation services for the Massachusetts port system. So a wide variety of languages. Um, that company also uh, can provide um, translation services of documents. I think it's a matter of getting everybody, um, and by everybody, I mean myself and Bree and other department heads together and formulating a plan that we can then try to carry out. So it's, it's, it is very much a work in progress. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela, and um, thank you, Anna. And I'm going to go to Councillor Walker. Um, if I could just ask, I do hear some background noise. I'm, I'm not sure where it's it's coming from, but um, yeah. it may help for folks. If... It, it, so it's probably coming from my location. So okay, <laughs> um, I, I, I um, have been having connectivity um, issues, and so I'm actually in the kitchen of a friend of mine. Oh, um, and okay. and there's. Um conversation going on in another oh room. no problem all right and so, so I, I i do apologize for that uh, no. and i will apologize for um for having to leave the uh the meeting a little bit earlier um so i'll just uh share that i have been uh, ill the last couple of days oh. and um and so i i've been really hanging in um, but my medication is wearing off and i uh, really can't can't stay much longer, but I welcome any additional questions.